Okay, I think it's time to, to start. I will start with a brief introduction. In the meantime, I think the others will uh, connect. And uh, okay, let's go ahead. I think you know me after five days of school. I'm Gemini Vione from CNR, the main public research center in Italy. I'm one of the two co chairs of the Energy Analysis and Data Fusion Technical Committee involved in the organization of the first edition of our online school. This is the last lesson related to polarimetric systems aperture radar. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce you the last three speakers of our school, Professor Alip Bhattacharya from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, Professor Alejandro Freire from the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and Dr. Ivan Kamandal from the Kansas State University in the United States. Before introducing the lesson, I'd like to spend some words about our speaker. I think most of you know both uh, Rick and Alejandro, who have supported our society since several years ago. Anyway, just a few words for those who don't know them. Okay. Arik Bhattacharya is a professor at the Center of Studies in Resources Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, India. He was a Canadian government research fellow at the Canadian Center for Remote Sensing in Ottawa, Canada. He received the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada's prestigious visiting scientist fellowship at the Canadian National Laboratories from 2008 to 2011. His current research interests include imaging radar polarimetry, statistical analysis of polarimetric synthetic aperture radar images, application of radar remote sensing in agriculture, urban and planetary studies. Dr. Battacharia is the editor-in-chief of the Tripolitio Science and Remote Sensing Letters. He is an associate editor of our journal, uh, of the Journal of Remote Sensing. In 2017, he established the RSS chapter of the Bombay section. He has been the publication chair of several IEEE science remote sensing conferences. He is the scientific committee member of the European Space Agency's Polinsal Workshop. He has been a member of the International Steering Committee and the International Advisory Committee member of the Asian Pacific uh, Conference on Synthetic Aperture Data 2021 and Big Bizarre Data 2021. Alejandro Freire is currently Professor of Statistics and Data Science with the Victoria U uh, University of Wellington, New Zealand. His uh, research interests are data visualization, statistical computing and stochastic modeling with application in signal and image processing and networks. After serving as associate editor for more than five years, Professor Freire was the editor-in-chief of the IEEE to Science and Remote Sensing Lecture for the period 2014-2018. He was the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society Distinguished Lecture during 2015-2019. Since 2019, he serves as a co member for our society in charge of future publication and plagiarism. Dr. Deepan Kamadal is a postdoc doctor a fellow at the Department of Agronomy. Kansas State University, United States. His research interests are precision agriculture and remote sensing, uh, biophysical parameter estimation and machine learning application. Dr. Mandal was the recipient of the IEEE Science and Remote Sensing Society Indian Best PhD Thesis Award in 2020 and the excellent PhD research from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay in 2021. This is the last uh, talk of our school, and this is entitled for Animatic Stereo Aperture Radar. In this lesson, Dr. Frey will uh, review the SAR data description and the statistical behavior of fully polarimetric data. Dr. Battacharia will cover the theory of SAR polarimetry with the major focus of SAR data representation, basic target characterization concept in recent advances, SAR data applications. Finally, the post practical section, uh, led by Dr. Mandal, will be focused on SAR data processing, SNAP, and Python. 
before giving to the floor some notes that you should know. I'd like to stress once more that the interaction with the audience is up to you, you up to the speaker, and you are free to manage the class as you prefer. You can decide to answer questions in each moment during the lesson or to play in some Q&A session during the, the lesson. Please consider that the chat box is not visible to the audience outside the Zoom class. So if you have a question in the chat box, please, before answering them, uh, read them to help people who are watching the live streaming in understanding them. For our audience, again, please try to uh, interact with our professor in any way, you know, for example, using the chat box, uh, raising your hands and so forth. So I think it's time to give the floor to our speaker. So Avik, Alejandro, Ivanka, the floor is yours. Well, I think I will begin. Thank you very much, Zemin. Uh, and congratulations for this beautiful initiative. Let me share, let me start by sharing, by making an announcement. Uh, the announcement is that, well, you have all uh, been attending this school. Uh, so if you are interested, there is this beautiful opportunity of participating on uh, of this conference that will take place in Hyderabad, India, at the beginning of next year. Uh, you have time to submit your contributions until, well, you have one week, a little bit more than one week, until the 15th. So that's an, that's an invitation. And my presentation, uh, please let me know, do you all see the slides? Sorry. Oh my. Do you see the slides, please? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So my, my this session is about SAR polarimetry. Uh, the idea is uh, having a view, a general view from the physics of the imaging to the applications. And my part kind of gets in the middle. It's about the statistical properties of SAR polarimetry. But before that, I would like to introduce my, my fellow Colleagues, how will how will be this the session? We will cover uh, in this part. Uh, it, at the beginning, we will cover the statistical properties of SAR. This this will be. Sorry, I'm still getting used to to this platform. We will cover the statistical properties of SAR. Uh, that's me, Alejandro Ferri, Victoria University of Wellington. Then Professor Avik will uh, present uh, data representation, target, uh, basic targets, elementary targets, uh, the, the ways to characterize uh, the, the information that we have in Pulsar data, new techniques in target characterization, and applications and tools. And finally, uh, Dr. Mandal will uh, present the applications uh, using SNAP and Anaconda uh, with beautiful developments made in, in Python. And he will discuss the use of a package that allows you to estimate biophysical parameters from crop, from crops. Okay, and he will conclude with dual pole descriptors. Okay, so let's begin. The idea is that we go from micro representation to macro representation. Micro is what we do not see. Macro is what we obtain. To what we, we get. So what's at the very, very, very low level of the interaction? We have an electromagnetic wave uh, 
Professor Bhattacharya will present this in more details. But imagine, just imagine that we have an electromagnetic wave that travels from the uh, sensing platform to the target. This electromagnetic wave interacts with the target and returns part of this energy. In the case of pulsar, this energy is in the microwave spectrum. But we will focus on what happens when the energy hits the target. When the energy hits the target because of its wavelength, its, sorry, its wavelength, it will interact with elements which are of size of the order of the wavelength, wavelength or less. We are talking about centimeters. So each of the elements that are able to interact with the electromagnetic energy will return to the sensor a portion of the received energy and will delay the energy by a certain phase. So each elementary backscatterer, each elementary backscatterer is represented by I, each elementary backscatterer will return to the sensor a complex number that has an amplitude and a phase. Well, this is the usual, this is the usual Euler representation of a complex number in which we have the real part and we have the imaginary part. Graphically, what, what happens? Backscatterer number one returns, let me change the color. Backscatterer number one returns this amount of energy. It's a complex number. This energy is added to the energy returned by the second backscatterer, and then it is added to the energy returned by the third backscatterer. The order is totally arbitrary. Then the fourth, and so on. And finally, what we get is this complex number detected by the sensor at a certain position in the target. So at a certain pixel, this is, we are talking about an elementary uh, component of our image, at a certain pixel, we will have this complex number. This happens pixel by pixel. So if we want to know what was in the target, and we know the, the frequency, the polarization, we know all the details about the signal we emitted. Well, we, we have at our sensor this information S, which is a complex number. Uh, in order to know, since we, we could aim at knowing precisely what happens inside each pixel. So we may aim at knowing each of these terms. Well, but that's not feasible. That's not practical because we are talking about many, many, many elementary backscatterers. Uh, imagine SAR image, for instance, has uh, 30 times 30, meters resolution, so each pixel sees a square of 30 times 30 meters in the ground. And imagine at this area, there are uh, pastures, there's pasture. So how many leaves of grass would we would have to model? How many of them? Many of them. So it's not practical. What we do is we try to model this as stochastic process. And how do we do that? 
we want to know the distribution of S. We want to know the distribution of this random vector. It's a complex number, so it's a random vector. In order to know it, we either specify the properties of each element. Sorry, this should be N and this should be N. We either specify the properties of each elementary backscatterer or we make hopefully sensible assumptions about what happens on the ground. Well, let's see what kind of assumptions we can make that lead us to a tractable problem. Uh, the slides are already in the repository that Professor Jemin provided, and then he will distribute this material. So you will find lots of references. There are lots of references at the end of my slides. So which are the uh, assumptions that we will make? And these assumptions are uh, sensible. We consider that the, these assumptions sensible in many situations. Well, we may assume that the scatterers, remember that we index the scatterers by i, and we assume that there are n scatterers. So the scatterers per resolution are in statistically independent. Independent. What does it mean? Well, it means that the characteristics of one leaf of grass does not affect the, char the characteristics of another leaf of grass. Well, it, it, it possibly makes sense. It possibly makes sense. And we may ignore the interaction between adjacent backscatterers. So, sorry, another typo. So, we may assume that, that these random variables are collectively independent. They are bivariate because A i is an amplitude and phi i is a phase. These are two random variables and we assume that they are collectively independent. Uh, we may also assume that the bus backscatterers are randomly positioned. So there is no geometrical structure in my inside my pixel. So there are, we may assume with this that the amplitudes and the faces are independent random variables. We may also assume that the amplitudes are independent, we already assumed that, but they are also identically distributed uh, with finite first and second moments. Well, what does it mean? How do we translate this? That we are, it translates into saying that we are seeing leaves of grass and there is no dominant backscatterer. So there is nothing strange in my pixel. Well, this, this hypothesis may be violated in high resolution SAR, but and we can tackle that, we can treat that situation. But let's see the, the simplest situation in which we are seeing many, many small independent things that don't interact. We may also assume that the face carries no information, so there is no alignment, the leaves of grass do not have any preferred orientation. It makes sense, mostly in natural targets. These assumptions are very sensible in natural targets. So we may assume that the faces follow the least informative distribution which is the uniform distribution. This is the notation, the uniform distribution between all possible angles. And finally, we may assume that the number 
of elementary backscatterers is very large, very, very, very large, infinitely large. This five hypotheses are often referred to as fully developed speckle. And they are usually valid, surprisingly valid, in natural targets as crops, pasture, and many other targets of this type. Well, what happens with this hypothesis? If we assume these five hypotheses valid, then S, the return, remember that this is the complex return, The complex return has a normal distribution with zero mean and same variance. So this is a random variable with zero mean. This is normal zero sigma square over two. This is just a convention. And this other is another normal with zero mean and variance sigma square over two. Sigma square over two is just a letter, just a number, a convenient way of describing the, the variance. Moreover, these two random variables are independent. So as usual, the central limit theorem comes to help us in a very com potentially complicated situation. Okay, but we illuminate uh, in a pulsar image with, in general, in the most general situation, four polarizations. Uh, we illuminate with horizontal polarization and we capture the return signal with horizontal polarization. This produces the SHH complex number. But we also illuminate with horizontal polarization and we capture the return with vertical polarization. This is the SHV polarization. And we illuminate with vertical and observe with horizontal or we illuminate with vertical, sorry, uh, this is VV and we retrieve with vertical. So we have potentially four different polarizations. In natural targets, holds that SHV equals SVH. This is called the reciprocity theorem. When this reciprocity theorem holds, instead of working with the, the whole four complex numbers. Remember that each of this is a complex number. Instead of working with four complex numbers, we may work with three complex numbers, another typo here. I will correct the slides. We may work with only three complex numbers and we call this the scattering vector. Why? Because of the reciprocity theorem. And remember, this is a bivariate normal distribution. This is another bivariate normal distribution. And this is another bivariate normal distribution. Uh, why bivariate? Because each element is a complex number. Woodman, in a pioneering work, he, the, the work by Woodman, the, the, the most important papers are from the 50s and this 63 paper is kind of a summary and extension of those two fundamental papers. Woodman derived many properties of S and many properties of derived quantities from S. So that is the fundamental work in statistical polarimetry or statistical optics. Using 
the assumptions of fully developed speckle, remember, SAR looking at grass. The scattering matrix, the scattering vector, sorry, scattering vector is comprised, as I already mentioned, as by three complex numbers. The question is, how are these three bivariate random variables, these three bivariate normal random variables, how do they work together? It's not enough to say that this is normal and this is normal and this is normal. I want to know the joint distribution. Well, Goodman proved that S follows a complex Gaussian distribution. I won't go into every detail, but it's enough to, to know that this complex Gaussian distribution needs only one parameter to be characterized, the covariance matrix. Since we're talking about complex, complex and complex, the covariance matrix is also a complex number. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's also a complex number with a certain symmetry structure. The good news, we seldom work with this format. Why? Because its signal to noise relation is not very favorable. So what we usually do, we average over L loops over the same scene. So imagine that I am looking at the scene of pasture. I take my polarimetric image, this one. Then I take the image again, the same conditions. Then I take it again, on the same conditions, then I take it again on the same conditions, they are random variables. So I observe four, in this example, four different outcomes from the same random variable. So I can average to improve the signal to noise ratio, but I don't average here. I will average in, in another way. Instead of working directly on S, remember S, please fix S on your mind. Fix S, I will correct it again. Fix S on your mind. This is S. And then I will, I will have L samples from this. How do we usually average these L samples. Well, instead of average directly L, I take L, uh, I, instead of average directly S, I take S and I multiply S by its transposed conjugate. So this is S, times its transposed conjugate, and I average L times this product, making it more explicit. Remember, this is S at site L. And this is the conjugate transposed of the same instant, the same look. Well, I make this product. This product is a matrix, so three times three complex matrix. And I average L of these three times three complex matrices, and then I divide by L. Well, I do the average in this sense. And we call this the L looks covariance matrix. The question is, Goodman had derived the distribution of S. S was a complex, normal, random variable characterized by a covariance matrix. Knowing this, how do I go from this 
to the distribution of Z. Who did that? Ultman. But let's make it more explicit. By proceeding in this way, what do we have? We have the average, you see the average of L copies of this matrix. Well, this average becomes this beautiful object in which the diagonals are non-negative numbers. The diagonal is formed by non-negative numbers. We call these elements the intensities. And the off-diagonal elements are complex numbers. So this is a complex number. All the off-diagonal elements are complex numbers. Look, this is the conjugate of this. This is the conjugate of that one. And this is the conjugate of that one. And we call this off-diagonal element the complex-valued covariances. So this is the object with which we work most of the time when we handle pulsar data. This is the covariance matrix format. And all the information that, that, the, that the pulsar sees is contained in this matrix. So you will see with Professor Bhattacharya several ways of extracting information from this matrix. What we will see is the statistical properties and why they are important. So remember, we knew that S was a complex, normal, random vector, and we made the average of S times S conjugate transpose. We made average averages of this and we form Z. Z is the object that we will work with. Okay, the wish of distribution. Behold, assuming that S follows a zero mean complex Gaussian distribution, Woodman, the same Woodman who proved this, the same guy proved the following. The distribution of Z is called multivariate scale complex, complex visual distribution. Remember that Z is the average. And this distribution is characterized by this deceivingly simple density. This density is indexed by Z, Z, ha, Z is the set of Hermitian, Hermitian positive definite matrices. Because all my observations are Hermitian positive definite complex matrices. The density is indexed by the covariance matrix that we saw before and by L, which is the number of loops. Why do I say that this density is deceivingly simple? Because if you look closely, let me erase a bit of the mess I made here. If you look closely, you will see that it, it is something quite familiar. How? Ah, I never seen that. Yes, you have seen this. You have seen densities of the form Z to the alpha minus one times X to the minus beta Z. Haven't you? Haven't you seen densities of this form? The gamma distribution has a density of this form. And behold, this has something very similar. Z to the L minus something 
times e to the minus something z. Only that now, z is a matrix. So, your suspicions are confirmed. This is very, very close to the gamma distribution. Only that, now we are talking about random matrices. We are no longer talking about univariate random variables, but we are very close. We are very close and the gamma distribution will appear. It will soon appear. Well, I will start mentioning properties. One of the interesting properties is that the, although this may look difficult to deal with, it's not, the maximum likelihood estimator of the parameter that indexes this distribution is just a sample mean. So what do I do? I have an image of an, an area of pasture. How do I estimate sigma? How do I put a hat on sigma? Statisticians, we do that all the same. If there is something we don't know, we put a hat. We make an estimator. How do I form an estimator? Well, the, the best, the maximum likelihood estimator is just the average of all the matrices that I have observed on the field in, in that piece, in that part of my image. How do, we, how do we obtain L? Well, L, we either obtain L by using information that the image prov provider gives us because the image provider tells us the nominal number of looks is, for instance, nine or six. Six is a relatively common number of loops. That is the nominal number of loops. Well, don't trust it. Go to the literature. You have plenty of references. You will see that we can estimate L you solving numerically a transcendental equation. Nothing out of this world. It's nothing that you cannot implement easily in R, in Python, whatever, even in basic. Sorry, not trying to offend anyone. So we can estimate the parameters by sigma hat and L hat based on data, based on Z1, Z2, Zn observations. So we can take samples, estimate, and then fit. But we are talking about a matrix valued random variable. That's impossible to see. So what we usually do is we, remember, I will write down Z now as a random variable is the intensity in the HH channel, the in the, sorry, the intensity, the intensity in the HB channel, the intensity in the VV channel. Then we have the covariance between HH and HV, the covariance between HH and VV, the covariance between HV and VV, and these are the conjugates of the of diagonal elements. So we have a matrix variate random variable. What we would usually like to do, well, we, uh, we would usually like to take, say, I would like to play with this guy, with I, H, H. So, is it immediate to know the distribution of A, so of I, H, H, given, sorry, the distribution of Z? No, it's not immediate, but it is possible to obtain. One of the fundamental papers that obtained marginal distributions is this paper by Lee and co-authors, 1994. So notice, Goodman, 1959, derived the Wisher distribution. Lee Hoppel, Manuel Miller, 1994, 
obtain some marginals. Which ones? The pairs of intensity, so the pair IHH, IHB, for instance, they also obtain, obtain the pair intensity phase difference, for instance, I, H, H, and the phase difference between Gov, H, 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 V, and Gov, H, H, V, V. This is another pair of random variables. So pairs of intensities, pairs of intensity phase difference, ratio of intensities, they also obtain the ratio H, H, for instance, A, I, H, V, and so on, and other marginals. <clears throat> this is a formidable work. This paper is absolutely fundamental. So we're talking 1959 to 1994. The next big step, 2006, Hagendorn, and authors, Hagendorn and authors found the distribution of the triplet I, H, H, I, H, V, I, V, V. So you may say, how come? Is it easier to work with this guy than to obtain these smaller guys? Yes, it's easier to work this than finding these. But since these have already been found, well, we're very happy and we use those results, okay? So we have plenty of partial knowledge. Why is this important? You will see with the Pankar how to use this to intensities. And in many papers, in many problems and situations, we are interested in phase differences. So th these properties are absolutely fundamental, fundamental, and we have those results. But notice the time gaps. You see, very, very beautiful, very interesting story. Okay, do these distributions work? Do they really, really explain data? Yes, in many, many situations, they do explain the data quite well. So here we see two fits. I won't go into the details of what is black, what is gray, but you see histograms of intensity measurements in the HH channel and how these intensities, these histograms are fit by these distributions. And I still haven't said, what's the distribution of a channel? Well, I think I will say now, the intensity of a channel, one intensity, if we are in face of fully developed speckle, it has a gamma distribution, gamma, the usual gamma, with a certain mean and shape parameter L, the number of loops. So mystery solved, we know how to make these plots and explain. It's not just an exercise in statistics. What do we do? We take a sample from an image, we make assumptions. We say, well, let's see if this sample, this scene comes from fully developed speckle. So if it comes from fully developed speckle, we should fit the gamma distribution. We, make, we take the sample, we make the histogram, we assume the gamma distribution, we estimate the mean, we estimate the number of looks, and we fit. Sometimes the fit is very bad. So what happens? Do we throw everything away? No, we say, well, what, what's, going, what's going on here? What's going on is that it's not fully developed speckle. If it were, I would have been able to fit the gamma distribution. If it's not, if the gamma distribution is not a good model, then 
something is happening there. What, what may be happening there? Well, maybe I don't have so many backscatterers. Imagine in a 30 times 30 meters pixel. Imagine that I am looking at a forest. What is the predominant return from a forest depending on the on the frequency? For certain frequencies, the predominant return is the trunk. How many trunks are there in a 30 times 30 meters area? Two, three, one, five. Well, that's far from infinite so the lack of fit of my data to the gamma distribution tells me what's in the scene and well if i am looking at an urban area how many houses do i see in a 30 times 30 pixel half a house a quarter of a house well then the gamma distribution will be a lousy model. It will be very bad. And then I will know that I am not looking at fully developed spectrum. So it tells me lots about what's happening on the scene. Do I have to care? So at this point, you have been four days looking at computer vision, deep learning, modern techniques, and now I drag you into classical statistics. You may be wondering, do I have to care about this? The question is, do you have to invest time in studying, understanding, and using this and other specific statistical properties? Or is it enough to fit the data into a black box that somebody made up with pandas or with whatever. Well, good news. You don't have to, you don't have to invest your valuable time in learning statistics. But also the good news, you should. Why? And I will give you a very, very simple example. And now I am reaching almost the end of my theory, of the theory. Here I present you models for two classes. So imagine I have an image, I took a sample from an area, and I took a sample from another area. From this area, I assume the gamma distribution and I estimated the mean and the number of looks. <clears throat> and I assume the number of looks is the same for the whole image. And from this area, I estimated also the ga another gamma distribution, mu hat, let's call it mu hat two, let's call this mu hat one, and the same number of looks of zero. Well, this is my, I will change the color. This is my gamma mu one hat l zero hat model and this is my other gamma mu two hat l zero hat so we have two densities what's the first thing that we are tempted to do when we have samples and models we build we will build a maximum likelihood classifier. So where's the, what's the maximum likelihood classifier in this case? It's the point where the densities cross, where the densities intersect. So my maximum likelihood classifier based on the gamma model, let's say X star gamma is here. But now I am lazy. I am very, very lazy. And I don't want to study the gamma distribution. So what do I do? With this sample, I estimate the mean of the normal distribution and the variance of a normal distribution. And with this sample, I estimate the mean of, a, of another normal distribution 
and the standard deviation, sorry, and the standard deviation of this other normal distribution. And then what do I do? Then since I am extremely lazy, I go back and I draw. This is my model for the first normal. This is my model for my other model. And I build my maximum likelihood classifier using the normal model. The classifiers, they are different, but they are not just different. They are very, very different. If I use this point, this point, classify data that actually follow this and this distribution, I will make very, very, very bad mistake because I am using a point that is far from the best point that I can get. And this is the possibly the simplest example. The simplest example is maximum likelihood classification. So if you want to use the slightest hint of statistical knowledge, yes, it's a good idea to understand, at least to understand at an operational level, what's happening when you deal with SARDAT. Okay, so it's a good investment. And we can build beautiful techniques. I will just mention some of these techniques and then I will give you a summary of, of the references. These are two UAV SAR images from an area of Los Angeles that was under urban development. Do you see this area here was empty? This is this is what fully developed slate speckle looked like. And then that area was urbanized. And we have a reference map of the change. Using the statistical properties, we can check where we have, and I will change to a very strong color. We can find statistically significant evidence of change. Using what? Using statistical models. Using what? Using the Wisher distribution. That's, this is a very tough problem for deep learning for a deep learning approach because we are talking about detecting changes in two epochs from one moment to another moment using very 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 noisy data so it's tough what do we find well using this using this approach I don't know what happened here using this approach we not only find the changes, but we find maps. So here we find or we build maps of statistical evidence. And you see these two maps are very good reminding that we are working with extremely noisy data. So this is a very beautiful solution for a tough problem using the properties of the Wishart distribution. With this, 
we may say this change from this date to the next is random, it's just noise. Or we can say the change from this date to the next is a relevant change. Operations that critically depend, critically depend on statistical properties. Speckle reduction. Speckle reduction really, really benefits from using the statistical properties of the data, and I provide you with references. Classification, well, as I mentioned, classification is severely affected by the quality of your, uh, of your model. Edge detection, well, I, I, I have studied edge detection a lot, and we, in this, in this and other papers, we have been able to detect edges under this intense noise using as few data points as possible. So that's a, it was a, that's a beautiful exercise. And as I mentioned, edge detection, that, that results that I mentioned you were from this paper, that's a, a, our paper. Uh, in all these works, all these works have in common that they use strongly statistical modeling. And I want to finish my part with research topics. There are so many of them. It's very, it was very hard for me to list in only one slide. <clears throat> you will see with Professor Avik different forms of presenting the data. We only saw the covariance matrix, but there are other ways. One of these ways is the Kino matrix. In this way, in, for this matrix, we don't know the statistical properties. So that is, in the way Woodman did that for the covariance matrix, well, this is an open research topic, which are the statistical properties of the Kino matrix and the, the right features which are the statistical properties of polarimetric decompositions. Because remember, a polarimetric data is a matrix. So if we want to visualize this data, we cannot do it. We have to transform, extract uh, components, or we may say that Z, that the observation, is a composition of, uh, is a composition of, say, pure noise composed with uh, uh, Z coming from trunks, composed with Z coming from leaves. And our problem is obtaining this, just an example, this decomposition. So extracting the elements from the matrix, which are the statistical properties of several well-known techniques we don't know. How can we exploit more general models? Because I only mentioned the Wishart, there are several, not too many, let's say half a dozen uh, relevant models for pulsar data, the we sharp the K, the G not, the G, the Kumeru, these are the ones that came to my mind when I was writing this, these slides. How can we exploit more their general their, their properties? Can we perform non-parametric estimation? I am totally in love with non-parametric statistics because it's uh, related to something which I like very much, which is robustness. So these things are usually related and we want to use non-parametrics and robustness in inference. And in general, how can we exploit the statistical properties for for instance, speckle reduction, classification, edge detection, change detection, etc., etc. How can we do 
better than what has already been done. And you saw the literature is very recent. And a teaser. Uh, this is a, a model that we have just submitted to a journal in which we obtain marginal intensities. These are models for the intensities. We obtain marginal intensities, which are multimodal without using mixtures. So this is a probability density function that describes the intensity with parameters, say, alpha, beta, L, as usual, and an extra parameter, lambda, that allows you to model multimodal data. Why is this interesting? Has this been done before? Yes, it has been done before with mixtures of distributions. In this case, we use, this is a single distribution that we call with this awful acronym CPTW. This has been just submitted. I submitted this paper today. So we are able to model multi-mode observations. Why is this important? High resolution SAR. In high resolution SAR, each pixel is likely to see, for instance, two types of targets, a dark one, and a bright one, because the pixel is very small, so it can see details. Well, with this new model, with the CPTW model, we can describe this with a single distribution. It's a teaser, it's the kind of thing that I am working with all the time. And well, I will correct the slides, so, uh, Jamin, please wait. I will change the ones that I uploaded. And here you have a set of references that I think are a good starting point for your study on this topic. And that is why I wanted to show, let me go back to here. Uh, here we are. I hope you have survived. Yeah. Okay. So questions, I, I, I wasn't, there's, there are two comments on the chat. Yes, we did. Okay. Yes, we did. You survived. Thank you very much, Ahmed. I'm, I'm happy to see that, that you survived. <laughs> well, There are no questions. I I let I leave you in better company with Professor Adi Bhattacharya. Thanks, Ahmed. If there are no questions, we can go ahead with Avik. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for that wonderful presentation, as always. Uh, okay, so i uh, start presenting my screen. Am I audible, uh, Jamie? Yes, you are, Abhi. Uh, thank you. So my screen is visible, presentation mode? Yes. Okay, thank you, Jimin. Before I start, thank you very much, the organizers, for this invitation to a wonderful event. Uh, this is a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this event. 
So after a very nice lecture, as you have just heard from my friend Alejandro, I'll move into uh, the more theoretical aspects and tools and applications of uh, SAR polar detection. And uh, after me, it will be Dr. Dipankar Mandel who will be talking about uh, the applications and will be using SNAP and Python tools, methodologies uh, which have been developed uh, in our lab and with uh, many collaborations. So moving into this, uh, the lecture topics uh, uh, will be uh, four lecture topics with me there. So it will be in two parts. There are four topics. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, some of the basic data representation, some basic target characteristic concepts, some new advances uh, which has been made in uh, the characterization of targets. End with uh, some data, some applications of full, full and dual polarimetric SAR data, and I'll tell you about some of the tools which are freely available, which you can use and play around uh, with the full and dual polarimetric SAR data. So uh, I have put them into two parts, part one and part two. And in between, I'll take a break of 10 minutes just to put you at ease with all the concepts which we will be discussing all over here. Let's move into uh, the data representation. So, just to very, very briefly basic is that uh, when we do Earth observation, we are utilizing the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's all the interplay of the electromagnetic spectrum. Either we are in the optical domain, which you have uh, uh, the the nanometer scale, or we are in the microwave domain where we are in the centimeter scale. So we'll be talking about here is the, the radar remote sensing, so active remote sensing. You can also do a passive way in microwave element. The common frequency band, which are bands which are used, are from uh, a longer wavelength from the P band to the K band. So just to give an idea of uh, just the uh, the movie, which is a clip from ESA, courtesy ESA, is uh, the acquisition of the SAR scanning from the Sentinel-1. This is how the SAR satellites scan over to form the images. The image, which is looks like this, is an image which is uh, from the place where I come from. It's the, this is where I'm at the moment, with the arrow shows it's in Mumbai the west coast of India. The image shows also some bright point or spots over here, which are all these areas which have uh, some small boats to ships and ferries and so on. This is what you typically see from an intensity synthetic aperture radar image of a channel. Importance, of course, we have images of an area which is on the southern part of India which is typically called as the rice bowl of India, because this area is all cultivated with paddy. This is a scene from Sentinel-1 SAR data and the corresponding scene of the Sentinel-2 optical data. And this is over the, the same region, same time during the monsoon, so it's cloud cover. So SAR allows us to do what we couldn't possibly do or it's difficult rather to do with an optical sensor when we have these areas covered with the clouds over the complete uh, uh, part of this region during the during the season. What typically we see is radar, which is measuring, it is measuring transmitter pulse, it's traveling with the velocity of light, and some of the energy is reflected back to the to the radar, and this is what we measure, and this is what is a sigma naught. So the normalized radar cross-section of the duct scatter is nothing but the energy of the received signal, which we energy scattered by an isotropic scatterer, which is over the energy received by the sensor. The duct scatter can be positive if you have the energy which is related towards the radar, and if you have it towards negative, it is away from the radar. The duct scatter typically is a function of many parameters, in shape and size and incidence angle, the dielectric properties and the roughness and so on. 
but typically if we just uh, talk about the typical backscatter ranges these are very typical they, they need not be accurate but if you have a very high backscatter possibly be from a man-made target uh, with very rough surface possibly high backscatter could be rough surface moderate could be from medium level of vegetation agricultural fields and so on and low could be from smooth surfaces calm water and so on so typically when we measure this backscatter, we can say that well possibly these are from these kinds of things. not always sure but just first hand information from a generic point of view there's a dust scattering that we see scattering from typically from different uh, wavelength bands for forest for dry soil for snow and all so you can see from where the scattering takes place it is over from the canopy or we have the scattering from somewhere in between or we are able to penetrate it and look in from the ground or so on so this is kind of typically where the scattering phase centers belong to so this gives you information of from where the scatter comes from in the form of a generic scattering properties of different targets talking about the geometry you know that size sar is a side looking so you have the two resolutions, two independent resolutions, the range resolutions, which is uh, dependent only on the signal bandwidth and the azimuth resolution, which is uh, dependent only on the along track antenna length. So why it is so important to have this synthetically, a synthetic aperture radar compared to what we already had before as a real aperture radar. The difference is with an example is that if you have a real aperture radar and we have certain certain values if we take for a typical radar we see that we get a resolution of the azimuth which is typically unusable for doing remote sensing for earth observation but if we do it on a synthetic aperture radar this is a much higher the resolutions becomes much higher resolution and hence uh, the user utilization of a synthetic aperture radar rather than using a real aperture radar for doing any earth observation. Typical types of sensors which have the altimeter, scatterometer, sound, but we will be looking at more in synthetic aperture radar. In this, we will have the polarimetric radar. We have can have a stereo radar, but we can also have we have an interferometric radar, which is just a fix. For this particular lecture. We'll be looking into the polarimetric aspects of it. So why it is so important? So polarization, why it is so important? Because it is an intrinsic properties of an electromagnetic wave. So we have the electric field component, which we can write in terms of its component as Ex and Ey. And since we consider the wave to be planar, so it's a transverse electromagnetic wave, there is no field. So you do not have anything in the Z component. And field that as it moves in space, so we can have at any instant of time in a very general form is a polarization ellipse. See that it can be very well written in terms of an equation of an ellipse. So it means if we have the two components to be equal in, in amplitude, the ex and the ey, and we have the, the delta, the phase difference between them. <coughs> Sorry. To be 90 degree, we have a very typical form of, of the polarization, which is circular. And if you have the ellipse squeezed, you have it in the linear. So you have either the X component or the Y component or a linear component in between them. So this is the typical way to represent the polarization state of a wave. And this, as I mentioned, is an intrinsic property of electromagnetic wave. This plays a very important role in uh, the sensors which we use for earth observation or orbitary observation. Now, coming to the sensor is that we do it in two ways. So either we have the 12 polarimetric system, Sentinel-1 kind of, and this is equivalent to analyzing the wave polarimetric region. So as you can see over here, that we have the transmit to be as one polarization and we receive the that, either that or the orthogonal to that. So receive, transmit an X, receive an X, and receive, transmit an X, and receive an Y to that. 
and this is what we have as a two cross one vector over here. This is the measurement we have. In terms of a sentinel, we have the, the PV or the VH or the HH or the HV. But when we move on to the full polarimetric system, so it's also the scattering polarimetry, we have a switch in between. So we transmit an X and an orthogonal to that as a Y, and we measure both of them. We measure the XX, the co-pole response and the cross-pole response. And that is kept in what is called as the scattering matrix or other known as a Sinclair matrix, which is a two cross two complex matrix. So this is the two measurements which we have. It's either the two cross two complex matrix in terms of when we have full polarimetric system, we have the dual polarimetric system and we only measure the two channel, the co and the cross. Now, how do we have this representation? What's happening? So if you see that if I have a target far enough from the transmitter, so the field incident on it can be assumed to be planar, so it's a plan plane wave. So we have the incident wave, which we can write in terms of components, so spherical components over here, and each of them, this component are complex. So the field incident of this target induces, of course, uh, a current, which then produces a field. And of course, we have the proper alignment of the coordinate system, and then we see the scattered field, there's a large distance from the scattered, can be represented in terms of uh, ES, which is the scattered field. Again, in terms of the, the theta and the phi, this, uh, so these are all again complex. Now, what is important? What we want to do is that uh, this, the desirable is that we want to define a parameter which characterizes the scattering properties of the target. So the idea is that how it can be related. That's where it comes into picture. Is that so? The incident wave. Is, uh, which is written in terms of this E theta incident over here, will of course produce the reflected field in the two components, theta and phi again. And uh, that is elliptically polarized. That is the general form of the polarization. And you can write it in this form. So the scattered in theta one is from theta one incident with uh, some, some scaling over here, which is also complex and also the phi component over here. So the each theta i produces these two. Similarly, you have another component, which is the phi component. It also again produces the theta two and phi two. So you have these two components again with the A1, A22, A12 and two two over here as complex. The simple is that if you can just put them together, very easy way to do that. So you can write it in this way as a very simple form. The final form can be written in terms of that the total ES the scattered is nothing, but there's the relationship with the incident and what is playing inside the role is this S over here, which has these components and which of all of them are complex in nature. And this exactly is what we measure is these the scattered, uh, is a scattering matrix for the Sinclair matrix. So the very beautiful way is to look into that this matrix characterizes the scattering properties of the target. But in general, of course, as we know, it's a non-symmetric, does not uh, depend on the polarization employed for the transmission. So you can see that this, you can also write the, the two components over here that the intensities of them are the backscatter coefficient for the, the two uh, theta and phi polarization. So with this, we move ahead and say that this is a representation we have. So we have the scattered zones matrix, which is a two cross one again, uh, a vector over here. And this is the incident one. And this has been transformed by this guy in front of it, which is the, the scattering matrix, the two cross two complex matrix. The properties are very beautiful that this is the one which describes the dependence of the scattering property on polarization. And it contains all the information about what has been changed in the polarization between the incidence and the scatter. And the dependency, which can be now uh, very well, we can see that it is a function of shape, material, moisture, any kind of different properties, physical properties, through its, of course, through its electrical properties. It depends on the EM frequency, the geometry, the coordinate system, depending on the EM wave in which the coordinate system you put.
Similarly, again, coming back to this, this is, you can represent them as each one of them is a, a two cross two complex. Each one of them is a complex matrix. You can write in them in terms of the amplitude and the phase. It's an absolute matrix. But without any loss of generality, you can take one of these phases outside, one of the phase outside, and you are left with uh, seven parameters, four in amplitude and three in phase over here. But these are now phase differences. Coming back to also a condition where it is for the backscatter case, the monostatic backscatter case, as you have seen before at the top, that we have the, the theorem of reciprocity that the HV is equal to VH. And in that case, we are left with only three amplitudes. So we, from seven, we come to five parameters. So the degrees of freedom comes from seven to five with three amplitude and two phases. And then simply, we can just use them to make an RGB just to have a visualization, which we call in the nomenclature of sour polarimetry as the poly uh, RGB image. This is just a false color composite. How does it look like typically? Just to have an idea about how it looks like. This is an image of the typical San Francisco data. It's a fully polarimetric SAR data. The poly RGB looks something like that. I zoom into this area where I have this certain pitch, the golden pen pitch. How does it look like in the the amplitude image or in this in separately in the real and the imaginary part of it. So as you can see, you can clearly see this uh, in the bridge, but you can see there are three lines over here. There are not three, not three, there are not three bridges over here. It's just that there are these echoes which are formed by different types of scattering, the water and the bridge, the bridge and the water, the bridge itself and so on. And those, so you have different echoes over here, which you can see in the intensity of HH. But you can not see much um, in respectively in the, in the real and the imaginary component. If I see it in the VV, not much change, but you can see, of course, that there is a change between the HH and the VV at certain scattering from certain areas. If you see the HV component over here, it tells, it shows that there is information which can be seen from also the, the real and the imagery part, and it can also be seen in its own intensity part. So this is the measurement which we have. So one pixel, one pixel corresponds to this complex measurement of this two cross two complex measurement. This is the starting point. This is the very beginning when we start uh, of radar polar Before going into uh, the details about the theory, let's see that there are many techniques. The technology has evolved through years. There are many techniques where we can use SAR data to do pole SAR, in SAR, pole in SAR, pole tomo SAR, pole type SAR. And all of them have been evolving in this golden age of SAR. So if you do pole SAR, we are trying to characterize with one measurement over here, this matrix trying to characterize uh, different kinds of scattering mechanisms and so on. If I do INSAR, I am getting at two vantage points. I'm utilizing only one channel, the, the intensity and the phase information to characterize elevation changes between two, two acquisitions. If I'm using pole INSAR, I'm trying to find out the full polarimetric information, unlike the interferometric and you have only one channel with the, the phase. Here I'm utilizing this fully polarimetric information. So I'm able to characterize over here the information about the change of height, but along with the scattering mechanism. And if I go to Tomosar, so it is the polarimetric, uh, full polarimetric information, but at various cross-sectional kind of thing where you get the information about tomography. Times are, this information the same, but at different uh, at different uh, timestamps. This is very will be useful for repeat uh, repeat pass over the same same area to see a lot of different changes in natural. For example, an example over here given in terms of source snow cover change analysis, uh, vegetation analysis, net change analysis, and so on. So these are the newer generation, the new way of looking into the the technologies of uh, SAR data. But here, as I mentioned, we'll be only talking about radar polarimetry. 
it deals of course with the full vector nature of the polarization polarized wave so the full polarized electromagnetic wave so we see that the that the sigma naught where you have a p transmit and a q polarization we see that i have seen before is a function of a complex function of uh, many types of information which are there for the target and it has been used only i have just mentioned a couple of them over here which has been used for many different applications from agriculture land use forestry uh, co geological application cryosphere and so on so we're moving into what is coherent and incoherent scattering life would have been easier everything would have been coherent so incoherent and we have incoherent so we have like targets like this which which has a very nice uh, geometrical structures and properties in contrast to areas which we have natural areas forest and agriculture and so on so if we had to only characterize in the target in a coherent matter then for a completely polarized wave then this s matrix which we have just uh, discussed it would have been enough the two cross two complex matrix s would have been enough to do everything but this is not the case when we are doing the remote sensing for first earth observation for natural targets well then it is partially polarized wave is not partially polarized then the utilization of the s only will not be enough so we need a statistical description of this s and we as you have seen just before the lecture of professor freli this is what we do is that if we have a coherent then this two cross two matrix was would have been enough but since we do not have everything to be coherent we go into the incoherent target so we have to go and there is a path to go there is a wire so how do we do that we first uh, transform this two cross two complex matrix into a vector and these vectors are defined in two ways depending upon what the basis matrix you choose to convert them to from a matrix to a vector so this is typically how you convert so there are two ways in which you can convert it either using a basis which is the pauli basis so this is the basis of the, the of the pauli basis and this is the one which is a lexicographic basis so you use these two bases to convert this uh, two cross two singular matrix into the vectors and then utilizing them you form this uh, covariance matrix well both of them are covariance in structure but just that in the nomenclature of uh, radar polarimetry we have two different names for that if i use uh, this uh, vector which is the one formed with lexicographic basis i call them as a covariance matrix but if i use the basis to be as the pauli basis then i use then i put them as this matrix as t and i call them as a covariance matrix both of them are as i mentioned are covariant in nature they have the same information but they are used for different properties to extract different kinds of information for different applications so these are the two ways in which you can represent the fully polarimetric sar data if you are in the coherent this is an s matrix if you are in the incoherent you do an ensembling averaging of that but there is another very nice way of representing it which is the kano matrix representation and the, this is represented in terms of the power representation if we have the s matrix we use the kronecker product to write this as the 4 cross 4 real matrix so unlike the one which you have a complex it is this one turns out to be a representation in the in the real domain the four cross four real matrix and if this matrix is again uh, is symmetric so it is it's a, it's a monostatic radar so you have the reciprocity this turns out to be a real symmetric matrix but if it's for a distributed target you can also represent them in terms of the k matrix the kenu matrix but unlike this you have just have an average quantity because the average comes from the elements of the covariance matrix 
And again, this is again a four cross four real matrix. Each element is a, is a real lump over here. Now, this is very useful in many applications. We'll see an example later on. And this was utilized by the work of Hoyman in, uh, in uh, 1970, in his uh, seminal work of his PhD thesis, where he tried to give the information the, in terms of some physical properties of Tarkin. So each, each element of uh, this Kano matrix is related physically to a target. So physical inter interpretation of these parameters are given, which actually was the starting point of radar polarimetry. And it is still used a lot in today's world. And this gives you a, a very nice insight of each an element, either of the coherency matrix or transform them into the Kano matrix. Now the question arises is why do we have these three representations and what can we do with them? Now, if you put them into a kind of a tri tri triangle, I can say that I have the Kano matrix over here. I have the covariance matrix and the covariance matrix in between is a sitting this S matrix, which is for the covariant case, the Sinclair matrix or scattering matrix. Now simply, we can transform from one to the other. It's very easy just to transform from a covariance to a covariance matrix. This is just an unitary transformation. You can go from the T to the K, from C to K and vice versa. You can go from one to the other. So the information is the same kept it's just that the representation is in different way. Here, we use a different uh, basis matrix for writing the T and the C. And here, we utilize them in a different way. We represent them as a, as a real representation for, for real. So we can go from to all of them from the S matrix itself. That's what we have seen. But just that, we have seen there is a dotted line, red line over here that this part you cannot take. Why? Because since you have already averaged out the quantity, there is no way of going back to finding out one single S matrix which corresponds to this average. So this is all about the representation of this data. Let's try to see how, how do we see just a data, a fully polarimetric SAR data for a visualization purpose. This is again the Google Earth image an optical sensor on the left hand side. And this is again a false color composite of a radar image over here. As you can see that here, the RGB characterizes different types of scattering from these different kinds of land covers which are there. Now, if I just try to see them each channel wise, this is again an image from ALOS2 fully polarimetric SAR data of the area of Mumbai. This is an HH intensity and an HP intensity and a VB intensity. Of course, you can see certain differences in those images of, from different land cover types. But in order to characterize the scattering properties coming from, from the tar target, it is better to represent them in the, the Pauli basis terms. So that means that they directly can be associated with the scattering properties of the image. So if I put them the same image, I put them to be as HH plus VB, HH minus VB and the HV, I can directly relate them to an odd bound scattering and an even bound scattering. So this kind of denotes, it tells you that this information, wherever it's high is characterized by an odd bound. So wherever this information is high is characterized by an even bound. Where this is characterized, this is kind of a randomness in the scattering because of the cross polarization being high, which is true as can be seen over here that from the water body, since it's a very smooth target over here, most of the things are coherent in nature. So the HV component over here could be very, very low, very less of cross polarization. And this gives an idea that this representation in the Pauli basis tells me that it is, we can utilize this because this is directly related to the scattering mechanism, scattering type coming from different targets. We look into this in more detail at a later stage. But as you can see here, we till now we have talked about only 
the representation in terms of age and phi, the horizontal and the vertical. But it is not, not necessary that always we only keep these bases, the horizontal and the vertical bases. Because maybe it's better to characterize in a target information in another basis. Because there are many bases in which you can go, an infinite number of bases. So if I can go from an, if I want to go from an HV basis, which is this representation, I want to go into another circular basis, which is a left and a right circular basis. I represent them again in terms of an false color composite, I get something like that. And I also, I can also go into another basis, which is a linear basis, but linear at 45 and minus 45 basis, I get something like that. So the image, of course, and the, and the false color composite look very different, but it might be useful for certain applications to infer information in another basis, not the usual H and P basis. And full polarimetric information allows us to do that because we can move from one basis to another, because this is just an unitary transformation from going from one basis to another basis. So the information is not changed but the way you can utilize them for different properties to character different properties or target is, is could be useful. Coming from the full polarimetric representation, which we have seen that it represented, can be represented in either the S matrix for coherent case, going from the S to the, the C matrix, the T matrix, which is the covariant structure, complex three cross three matrices, or to a four cross four, real matrix, we can also find tell that what is then the dual re pole representation, the sentinel data, the VVVA, so the HHV, HV data. So if you can, you can think of as the projection of the full pole data into a vector, as for example, if I have an HHV, then I can think of that this is nothing but the projection of a the S matrix into a vector one zero. And similarly for a VV, it is something like a zero one. So this can be thought of as a projection of the full matrix into just one Jones vector. But again, I can form from this, I can form uh, the covalent structure. But in, in this case, unlike what we have before, the three cross three complex matrix in terms of the full polarimetric data, the dual whole case we can form the two cross two complex matrix in which the diagonals are the intensities of the co and the cross and the off diagonal tells you about the correlation between the co and the cross. So this is the, the representation of uh, the dual polarimetric SAR data. So similar to the dual polarimetric, we have another mode which is the compact polarimetric representation and similarly as a dual pole, it can be also thought of as a projection again, but a slightly different kind of projection over here. So you can thought of that this is a projection of the full pole matrix into something like an one plus minus i over here, which gives you the left and the right circular. So you can also utilize them to form again the two cross two complex matrix, or you can write it in terms of the elements in terms of the Stokes vector. So the idea is that, that coming from the representation for full polarimetric SAR data, which is the S matrix, the coherent representation, the incoherent representation is it going from the S to the vectorization of the matrix using some basis element. The basis element are, are the poly basis for the lexicographic. And from there going to the T or the C matrices over there, which are the covariant structures. And these are three cross three again, complex matrices. But you can also go from the complex representation to a real representation, which then you end up with the Keno matrix, which is a four cross four real representation. So, and when you have the dual representation can be thought of as the projection of the two cross two complex matrix into either the one zero or the zero one for the dual linear representation, which is the sentinel kind, or you can go to the compact representation, for example, the RCF kind of data representation, where you have the projection of uh, the 
S matrix again into uh, the one y i the one plus minus i. So it is uh, for left and right circular representation where you can also write the C two matrix over here. So till now we took into the data representation. We go into some of the basic target characterization concepts. Now, what is the idea? The idea is that when we have this measured S matrix, can I just break it up into constituent elements in which I can say that each one of them is characterizing a particular kind of a target. And this is the coherent target characterization or the coherent target decomposition. So you are trying to decompose a measured S matrix into some constituent S matrix, which are some of the elementary targets which are known, a priori known, so that the idea is that with some scaling over here, can I break it up into the constituent elementary or canonical targets? So many, many theorems and many techniques have been evolved in the past, and it is also a very hot topic of research. And now to characterize the S matrix this, the, for the coherent case into various different types of targets. So kind of classifying them in different kinds of elementary targets or canonical targets. But in order to do that, the fundamental nature that why, how and why we need to do that. The fundamental nature comes from what is called as a signature. So I can use different canonical targets. So in this case, I use a trihedral, which gives me an odd number of bounces, a dihedral, an even number of uh, bounces, a dipole, and helix kind of a helix target. And you can see that these, these give me different kinds of a signature. The signature in copole where the x axis over here talks about the ellipticity and this call corresponds to the orientation of. So you can see that these different kinds, all these targets have different kinds of signature. So this tells me that I can decompose or represent a measured S matrix into constituents, all of these targets, maybe all of them or a few of them. So the idea is that I am able to characterize a measured information in some scaled form of this canonical target. This is the representation when you have them in the co-polarized mode. That means uh, whatever the polarization is transmit, you are measuring in the same polarization. So that's why it's co. And similarly, the cross tells you that whatever is the polarization of the transmit, you are measuring in the orthogonal. So as you can see, they also have a different kinds of signal. Then which tells me that the polarization signature is the fundamental behind it, characterizing the, the scattering properties of uh, a measurement from a, from a pixel in terms of an S matrix into its many constituents. So going from here, I go into the target decomposition concept. The concept is again simple over here that we have measurements over many of these Sinclair matrices over here, which then can be transformed into again a three cross. But remember over here, see that over here, there is no averaging done over here. It's just the, the transformation of this into the T or the C that can also be done. But the idea is that we form an average target. So the idea, the average target is formed by assembling them, all of them together. So these are the samples you have, you are assembling them together and you form an average target. The idea is that can I now, this is the measurement which you have. So you have, you have the ensemble average over the neighborhood pixels. And the idea is that can we again break it up into constituent elements in which they could possibly be a pure target and kind of a residue. So this is what is the idea behind doing the decomposition. Similar to as what we have seen, first we have seen the coherent, but we have seen that we can go from this coherent, the pure target form into something like a distributed form. From S we go to the, the T or the C matrix. Many techniques have been developed in the past and have been ongoing research in this field of how well, how better can you characterize uh, 
the scattering mechanism from this kind of a distributed and an average target. I'll just talk about only, uh, only two of them and I call them as a conventional setting. This is there in the literature and has been the mostly used in the literature. One come from some model based decomposition. The name suggests that I'm trying to fit in a model to my measurement. The other is more a mathematical description and mathematical abstraction of characterizing the, the matrix, which is uh, in this case a three cross three complex matrix with certain properties, certain very elegant properties, and to characterize them in terms of the eigenvector and the eigenvalues. And then utilizing them to characterize the scattering type or the scattering mechanism of the target. These I call them as the conventional set. The other two are in this blue is I call as a non-conventional set. One is called the scattering power factorization. So unlike decomposition, which is meant over here, this is a factorization process. And the other one is unlike the model based decomposition, which is of course fitting into model, I go as model free. I don't need model as such over here. So how do we do that? Let's go a little bit quickly into one by one. So the model based decomposition pioneered by Freeman and Durden later on has been, as I mentioned, has been uh, utilized by many and as many beautiful methods have been proposed in the literature and is being a topic of research uh, since uh, a, a long time now. So the idea is that simple, I have this measured, I want to break it up into some constituents where it is the surface or the trihedral or dihedral and some kind of a volume. All of them are some models which are written on the right hand side. So the idea is that breaking them up into certain constituents element. Of course, with certain very strict assumptions you have to make in order to solve these equations and so on. And it was done by Freeman with only three components. So that you can break it up into only three constituent component. And you can see that we can break it up this image, which was the poly RGB image, which was a false color composite, which tells me about certain information about where possibly is uh, the surface, where possibly could be uh, a kind of a double bounce coming out from urban areas and so on. And the green corresponding to the cross polarization. Here you can find out in terms of the power, the power scattered power information where you can say there's a PS which correspond to the surface and the dihedral coming from the urban areas over here and the volume. This was the one which is done initially. Then it was in uh, 2000, around five came with the four component of Yamaguchi is that you have the surface, the dihedral, the volume, but there is also a property of an helix because this correspond to the asymmetry over here. So, before, as you have seen, there was a reflection symmetry. There is no reflection symmetry assumption has been taken over here. Helix can be thought of as a target which uh, transforms the linear polarization into circular polarization. Well, this is seldom occurs. Uh, it is uh, rare, but it, it do occur in uh, areas of urban area because of complex scattering. So in the sense, now you have four component, unlike the Freeman Durden, which was started with three component over here. Now you have the four components over here. And if I utilize them to find out the same way, but I again put the PS, PB, PV, of course, I cannot put at the fourth component over here. I put the same and I see that there is an increase an enhancement of the scattering power in this area, which corresponds to the Narcot area which was not there in the previous case. But there are, of course, there are also certain pro problems which was noticed because of certain geometrical issues which happens in this urban area because of the radar line of sight problem, the orientation problem. And this was solved again by a simple unitary rotation of uh, the measure and doing the same thing again. And it turns out that this gives a very nice information about the targets which are there. A comparison of all of them and side by side shows that we are doing better with the one which is kind of a compensation of the urban area with a unitary location. 
this was the starting point of model based decomposition and from here onwards many sophisticated methods have been uh, have been proposed uh, to characterize much in a much much better way with more components to look into more finer details the eigen vector eigen value decomposition as the name suggests is just the, that you have it was started by uh, cloud and potier with uh, something which is called as the h a alpha which h for is for entropy a for an isotropy and alpha is a scattering mechanism and actor so the idea is again the same i take the s matrix and i make the scattering vector from here i get the t matrix which is again a three cross three i do an eigen decomposition where i get the eigen vectors the three orthogonal eigen vectors i get the real eigen values because this matrix is a is hermitian and positive semi definite and hence uh, the eigen values are real and non negative utilizing these properties i can i get so it is parameterized so the so the it was proposed by the cloud uh, to parameterize the the eigen vectors in terms of uh, the uh, the parameters as alpha beta and delta which are the phase angle so the alpha corresponds to the scattering type mechanism and you can use the lambdas to find out kind of a pseudo probability measure which can can be utilized to find out the average information of the alpha so this was uh, the uh, property this was the decomposition which was proposed using the eigen vector but it also has very nice property of role invariance because we do not want the, a polarimetric parameter which is measured to change with the role of the sensor or the role or the change of the in of the angle of the target so this needs to be a role invariant parameter should not change with the orientation so it was seen that if you try to find out the orientation property if you orient this the coherency matrix then you can see that these alpha parameters still stays invariant where other the other parameter the other parameterized uh, one changes so the alpha is a role invariant parameter and since the eigen values are also role invariant hence uh, the parameter which is the average of all of them the alpha parameter is also role invariant this is used to characterize the target properties over here this parameter varies from 0 to 90 which can be utilized to characterize different targets zero being being from the surface kind of scattering and if you go on to 90 degree so it it's more of a dihedral kind of scattering so this is what has been used as from cloud alpha to characterize different scattering types information the degree of randomness which is characterized by the polarimetric entropy parameter has been also used to characterize a target be pure or distributed and as you can see that it has been characterized from 0 to 1 the one being it is not random at all and 0 means not random at all and 1 means it is completely random and you can see that this characterizes the information coming from over here the natural target being very very random which uh, is quite obvious in the sense where this calm water is of course a non randomness over there is no randomness over here and in between where you have this urban area it is somewhere in between because it is kind of an urban area mixed with vegetation and so on these two parameters then can be used to find out a clustering this is the clustering with no a priori information and as you can see you can just have the entropy in the axis and the alpha on the y axis and this has been just uh, given some clusters over here from 1 to 9 9 being the non feasible this can be shown that this is the boundary of uh, the region of alpha and entropy you cannot have an alpha over in this region it is not physically possible it can be proved and hence this this uh, this area this plane has been characterized with the with different information coming from different types of scatter this has been found empirically and formed these eight clusters and these clusters can then be used to form a segmentation so you can easily form these eight different clusters 
without any a priori information, only utilizing the physics of scattering and from the data itself. You can also form another parameter, which is the scattering anisotropy. It actually tells you about that when you try to discriminate when the entropy is very high. That means if there is a, is a complementary information to the entropy, telling that whether there is a secondary scattering information or not. This can also be utilized to, to utilize them in terms of the H and alpha uh, decomposition. You can also have this as an HA. So that means you can utilize them not in eight, para, eight clusters, but you can also double this number of clusters to 16 to have more finer details to see if there is a secondary amount of info, secondary scattering information, which is also existing over here. But you can also see that the scattering power is nothing but the summation over all of them together. Which then tells us that these three parameters, the H and the entropy, the entropy, the anisotropy and the alpha could be very nicely used to characterize scattering from different land covers from a synthetic aperture radar full polarimetric SAR data. This is an anisotropy parameter which is after this, there has been many several new advances which has been proposed. Some of them are based on unitary transformation. One which utilizes statistical information theory. This is the only one which is available in the literature. It's a model-based decomposition. So it, it incorporates model-based and statistical information together to form, to give the information about the scattering mechanism. There has been model-based decomposition, which utilizes some of the information of decorrelating the polarization channels. And there are certain which has been utilizing the compact polarimetric data. But these are only, only a few and a handful of them. If you see the literature, there are, there are many, many are available. And of course, uh, you, I, I, I ask you to utilize uh, the very nice uh, Pulsar Pro software, which is from ESA, they have a lot many more functionalities inside that. And I've just shown only one of them is that you can see that the one which utilizes model based and statistical information theory, this is the first of the use of this concept is also there as a part of uh, this Pulsar Pro toolbox. And it can be utilized to get uh, the scattering mechanism from for different areas. You can see this is an, for an example, an image of ALOS 2 full polarimetric data from Barcelona. This is the one image. This is the decomposition which has been done with the one existing literature from the Yamaguchi for component decomposition. And you can see more advancement and enhancement of the scattering mechanism utilizing this uh, one which utilizes the model based along with the statistical information. Next, next image also shows about the information coming from an ALOS2 from every area of Kyoto. It's uh, very complex in the sense that this urban area is quite complex to characterize because of certain orientation and density. And you can see, you can hardly find out this information in uh, the existing any existing methods which were there before yeah, again but with this new methodology which incorporates module based along with the statistical information then it is able to very nicely characterize uh, the scattering properties from here in terms of the powers so till now what we have seen is the first representation in different form starting from the two plus two complex uh, sinclair matrix Going on to the ensemble average information from the covariance structure, the covariance and the covariance, the covariance and the covariance matrix, utilizing two different forms of the basis matrix. From there, you have seen how we can then utilize this data to characterize target information. If either we are in the S matrix, so the pure target case, we can utilize them to form summation, sum of weighted sum of canonical targets. Or if you are in the ensembled average case, and you have the co covariance in the coherency matrix, you can have the, we have, what we have seen is that the conventional setting, you can have the model based where you try to fit into model. 
into this representation, this data, or you can do by an abstraction, a mathematical abstraction, where you extract the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are parameterized, and these parameters is, are then utilized to characterize scattering from target. The eigenvalues are the scaling of uh, these scattering mechanisms. We have seen some advances uh, from there on, only a handful of them. Advances just to sail from di in different directions, actually, in terms of characterizing it with, a, with utilizing statistical properties, correlate, be correlating information which are there in the covariance structure. Or there are several advances in which there are many other models which have been utilized. And we have shown some here, some examples. With this, I come to a break. Uh, so I take a very short break. Uh, we'll be back in less than 10 minutes. And we start with uh, the two other uh, topics which are left. Okay, thank you so much, Arik. Let's have a break, 10 minutes break. If you have any questions again, uh, don't be shy. So you can write them on our chat box or you can do this live, uh, rising hands and so on. Thank, so you. thank you. We'll be back in less than 10 minutes. Thank you very much.
Okay, so uh, welcome back. So Jimmy, can I start? Yeah, yeah, there is a question in the chat box. So you want to take the question to the questions now or to the at the end of the session? No, no, no. You can address it now. Okay, so I yeah, I see one question over here. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just read out the question. It is uh, how do these decomposition techniques work in dual polarimetric case in comparison with full polarimetric example for Sentinel one? Uh, Yes, that's a very nice question. Yes, the first, first answer is that they do not work uh, directly like how you have, how I have explained in terms of uh, utilizing them in terms of fully polarimetric way, in terms of model or I can value decomposition, particularly in the Sentinel case, because you have VV and the VH or the HH and the HV. You don't have the two copole channel information, so it is will be difficult to actually characterize uh, between a single and odd and an even bounds case. So you can, of course, utilize the covariance matrix to find out uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. They can be similarly parameterized, uh, and you can get an alpha from them. But this alpha will not will not be able to characterize between a single and a double bounds or even odd even bounds of scattering mechanism. So you cannot directly go from the what you have been doing for full pole to uh, dual pole, for a dual pole case. Why? Because the first thing that I have mentioned is that in full polarimetric case, you are dealing with the scattering polarimetry. On the dual pole case is the wave polarimetric case. So they are two different ways of doing it. But yes, there are ways of doing it. You can always, always write these, these dual polarimetric data in terms of the Stokes parameter. The Stokes, Stokes parameter then allows you to find, to, uh, to utilize the phase difference information and so on in order to characterize them in terms of certain kinds of scattering. And there has been very recent work, which has been published recent work. You can see a very nice study, which has proposed a model-based decomposition for dual polarimetric SAR data in Sentinel-1. Very nice approach, a very nice way to characterize scattering mechanism from dual polarimetric SAR data. So the answer, in, again, in very brief is that it's not the direct way of doing from full pole to dual pole because of the unavailability of uh, the two copolarization channel. So you are, will not be able to characterize between even odd bounds mechanism. So it is decomp you will be able to decompose it, but not the same way or exactly the equivalent way as you would do in a full polarimetric way. So that's uh, the, the answer. But there are, has been a lot of research going on in this direction in how to better characterize the dual polarimetric SAR data uh, coming from what has been learned from uh, full polarimetric SAR data to characterize that. So that's uh, the answer. So moving on to uh, the next the topic is that is some of the new advances in target scattering concepts as a part two. So let's look into the, the second part of it is the, the one which we have seen before is the conventional setting. And let's go into something which is a non-conventional setting. Now, why do I call them as a non-conventional setting? So let's try to look into it from a different angle, a more from a geometrical perspective of of representation of polarimetric SAR. We have seen some representation. I'll again, again tell that these are for S matrix, the pure case, you have the, the distributed target for T and the C case. And also, also, I have also mentioned that you have a real representation, which is the Keno matrix. Now, let us try to analyze them from a geometrical perspective. So you can do some geometrical analysis of full polarimetric SAR data. So the idea is that this is forming a geodesic distance 
over the space in which the Kano matrices, the four cross four real matrices lie by utilizing very simple notion of trace. And you can see that this is the one which is over here is actually the geodesic distance between two Kano matrices which are in the space of four cross four real matrices. And they can be, they are scaled to be in between zero to one. So you form, you can form and they have some very nice property of scale invariants and so on. And this allows us then to utilize this property of the fully polarimetric SAR data, of course, and also utilizing some geometrical properties to form, to utilize them in terms of characterizing them some role invariant scattering descriptors. Can I utilize them to characterize role invariant scattering descriptors, which I have done before utilizing, as I've said, the eigen based method. How can I do the same thing from here, taking this kind of information to find our scattering powers? What we have seen before, we have seen decomposition of a scattering power. So model based decomposition where you can get the powers. So you have the coherence, the covariance matrix, you decompose them and you say these are the constituents power in the single bound, the odd bound, so surface and dihedral and volume and so on. Can I do the same thing utilizing such a notion of distance measure over the space of these matrices, which are representation of polarimetric SAR data? In this case, we are only talking about poly polarimetric SAR data. And then, of course, have some applications for Earth observation. So let us try to look into some of the scattering type parameters. The scattering type parameters, as we have seen before, is the alpha parameter, which was proposed by Cloud and others, which characterizes the information. Either this the target is uh, is an odd bounds and an even bounds with an, and this is a continue on a continuous scale from zero to ninety. Zero gives you the complete trihedral kind of scattering where you have uh, the, the 90 degree gives you a uh, uh, dihedral kind of scattering and odd and even power. So can I do the same thing utilizing the notion of this geodesic distance between uh, the Kano matrices? Yes, the answer is yes. And that's what exactly has been done is that the geodesic distance between a measured kind of Kano matrix and a trihedral a Kano matrix corresponding to a trihedral. So this is the canonical target. I just multiplied it by 90 to scale between 0 and x so that I can have an equivalent kind of a measurement with the cloud. And as you can see that oh, on the right hand side on the red dotted box is that utilizing them, I can characterize different targets over here, the trihedral in KT and so on and so forth. And up to dihedral, which is 90 exactly the opposite I can do, which we have also seen in alpha. But this red dot box on inside shows that there is a kind of a confusion when I have the dihedral and I have helix, helix which corresponds to an asymmetric kind of a target. So when I have that, there is a confusion. That means if I have two targets, from which are dihedral and of course helix, I won't be able to characterize them. So this is kind of a problem over here. But just to see the image of how it can be done, this is an image of uh, Alos 2 Pauli RGB over the Mumbai over Mumbai area. And you can see with this parameter, the alpha GD corresponding to the geodesic distance based alpha corresponding to the not bounds in blue and an even bounds and nicely characterize this. So the idea, as I've said before, is then, is there a way to characterize this amount of asymmetry? And this is the way to do that. So it is something like a, a combination or a geometric mean between the geodesic distance for the target, this K is the measured, the measured, and something like the distance between the left helix and the right helix and one minus of that because this is the distance. So this is one minus of that. And I write that we are tau, tau or tau GD, a geodesic distance. And now you see you are able to discriminate with this. So that means tau for a helix is 45 degree, but it is 
very as i said it's a symmetric it's a non symmetric information so it is zero for a trihedral and some value non zero value for dihedral but not the same again so i'm able to characterize them. but this as i mentioned is a very kind of a unique kind of target not that it, it can have that over um, all the areas it only happens in very specific areas for very particular kind of target and only over urban area you can see that this is kind of the image which looks like the scale being again 0 to 45 so it's a stretch scale but you can see only some values which will happen only in the urban area though they are very low but can we also find some kind of a purity measure amount the, you have seen now there is a scattering type but you have not correspondingly found out the amount of purity in the type we have only said there is a scattering type information with alpha so is there any possibility of finding out a purity measure and that's exactly over here what we do we measure something like again a distance between between a keno matrix and a complete depolarizer a depolarizer is something like when you have a this depolarizer any polarized wave coming in is will be completely depolarized when it goes through such kind of material so in this way we are able to find out that if it is an ideal depolarizer which is an ideal condition of course it never happens this is zero and if it is a coherent target trihedral or dihedral a very canonical elementary target this is equal to 1 so it varies between again 0 and 1 which tells you this is kind of an information that means the water body will be more more highly scattering purity whereas the urban area will be having a some kind of a mix area which is less than uh, less than one greater than zero somewhere in between so this tells you about that uh, this information is characterizing the scattering type information but it is giving you the amount of purity because a scattering mechanism can be anything but the purity can vary this is another parameter which is very very, very useful because it will essentially give you the information of the amount of pureness in the type of scattering mechanism. So with this information of only the measure of a geodesic distance between the observed Kenyu matrix and some canonical target, which are of course there in literature, there in nature, I am able to find out the geodesic distance between them, in a very simple way, and I am able to characterize target. Not only the characterize the target in terms of mechanism, but also in terms of purity and asymmetry and so on and so forth. Now, utilizing them, the idea is that how can I find out the power information? Because power information is more closer to the reality, as you have seen, that power information gives you the information of what the power coming from a, a surface like or a dihedral like and so on. The idea is that is it possible to do that with uh, this kind of uh, uh, the concept? But we can do that, of course, not only we can do that, we can do it for a generalized case. We can do it for any n given target. What you have seen before that it was started with the three component in model based, then it was four. Now you have many other, many, many components have been proposed. But this is, we can generalize it to an n component over here. And it's something like what we are trying to do, the span is a total power. The idea is that break up this total power into many constituents. So this is a simple way of doing it by just breaking them up into many different components. But the idea is that whatever components, however many components you give, you'll be always left with a recipe. So if you bring in many components, two or three or four or 10 or whatever, you will be always raised with a recipe. So the residue is the one which is this component. But then this is the one which corresponds to the, the targets of information. And hence, this is called a factorization, not a decomposition because we are factoring it out. So the first one is the dominant. The second one is the next dominant and so on. So we are factorizing it depending upon the dominance of the scatter. Whereas in decomposition, you are just adding them up. You do not care about the dominance at all. Of course, the power scaled to a dominancy, but here the dominancy is, is by the factor. So the first one is dominant, then the next one is the second dominant and so on. So you're factorizing the power out of it. 
You can see some examples of images. Let's say, for example, this is an Alos image of area which you have ships inside it. And you can see that you are able to characterize them with different mechanisms over here. This is the first dominant mechanism. That means the first dominant for the water body will be a trihedron. The first dominant for this one will be a narrow dihedron. And so on and so forth. You can go for second and third and so on. But well, like, as you go beyond second and third, it will be more noise like, which is uh, understandable. Similarly, if you go for this area, which is a San Francisco area, uh, and you can see this is an urban area with some vegetation and water body, this is the first dominant, which is again true because the water body will be the first dominant will be the trihedron, known from literature. There's urban areas which we over here will have trihedral and so on. And as you move on, it will be again more and more of, uh, of noisy light. I can utilize them to characterize this image into an area which is from Alos to Mumbai. I can find out kind of classes for the type of scattering over here. Because this is also important. Not only the powers I'm trying to find out, but I'm also trying to find out the mechanism along with that, which is possible with this. And then you can go to find the power. So you can find out, I just switch back and forth. You can find out the mechanism and then you can find the power source. Simple. So this is an, a non, as I mentioned again, this is a non-conventional setting because it is not decomposition, it is factorizing and utilizing a very simple notion of a geodesic distance between the measured Keno matrix and the, the canonical target corresponding to a Keno matrix. This formulation can be easily extended if and if you have coherency or covariance matrix. It's like the same, no problem at all. We go to the next one, which is the model free decomposition. So the model free, the name suggests is that we are trying to avoid model because model brings non uniqueness. So the idea is that how to go remove this, this non uniqueness. So to remove this non uniqueness, a unique way out is to utilize in a very simple way. The simple way is that in one hand, we have the elements of the coherency matrix, which is the measured one. There is a, an information about the amount of degree of polarization given long back in the optical uh, theory in optics, uh, Baraka in 77. It has been, of course, utilized in the domain of radar polarimetry, but not so much. It gives you information about the degree of polarization. So the idea is, can I bring in the amount of degree of polarization along with the elements of the coherency matrix and to find out a scattering type mechanism, the scattering type parameter, which is similarly as we have seen before as cloud or the al cloud alpha or the alpha GD. Similar, of course, not the same. Then to utilize them and then to find out from here, directly find the scattering powers. You don't have to go to anywhere else. Why it is so important? It is important because it is model free. It justifies uniqueness. It is unique because if you change the model in a model based decomposition, you lose the uniqueness. Scattering type allows and power simultaneously. So not that you have to go to find out powers using a model based and then come to another method to find out uh, the, 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 uh, the scattering powers. So not that you are going from one one, one methodology to another methodology to find out mechanism and power, it can be done in seamlessly in one way. One method, it does everything. There are no hierarchy and criteria which are followed in model-based decomposition. If you see the literature, there are many conditions and hierarchies and criteria are there which are utilized for computation of powers. Here, here we are devoid of all these things. There are no non-negative power, which is a which is a main problem in model-based decomposition. There is it is can be equivalently done for full pole, uh, uh, compact pole, and dual copole mode. That is for an HHVV kind of a mode, not HHHV mode, but HHVV kind of a mode, like the Terras RX kind of a mode. And of course, the bi-static also it can be. Uh, it can be also extended to that. So, but this is equivalent. This is equivalent for all of them. 
and they are all load, rolling gradient parameters, so you don't have to worry about them. This by the mayor construction, they are all rolling gradient scattering information. So the idea is that simple. I will just go on to that. So the, the parameter is this one. This is the theta FP parameter, which I'm talking about, the scattering type information. But if you see that the information which it utilizes are actually coming from the notion of the Hoynen method, Hoynen phenological, phenomenological theory, which is being proposed by him. So all of this information are actually coming from here. So I have a part, which is the regular part. I have a part which is coming from the irregular part, which is the B0. B0 is also called as the target structure information in the terms of Hoynen himself. This parameter is varies from minus 45 to 45. Minus 45 corresponds to a pure dihedral, plus 45 corresponds to a pure trihedral. I use a parameter M over here, and it's exactly what I call, as I mentioned before, is a Baraka degree of polarization, which characterizes the amount of polarization structure. Again, varies from zero to one. One being completely polarized, zero being completely unpolarized. Utilizing them, I utilizing all this, this is nothing but only the elements of the T matrix, the coherency matrix, and this M, which also depends upon the determinant and the trace of this matrix. So it can be, all of them could be found very, very simply and easily and fast. So I can utilize them to find out just the power, which is the diffused power, which is nothing but the total power multiplied by the one minus the polarized power. One minus the polarized is the unpolarized part. So the total power multiplied with this fraction is the diffused power. Now, if I if I just subtract this power from the total power, I get the total, I get the polarized power. Because the total power minus the diffused power is the polarized power. Now, what do I do with this? I already have the polarized power. So I have to just uh, make a kind of a geometric scaling. So the geometric scaling is utilizing the, this parameter, which is a scattering parameter into an even and an odd bounds. So the two extremities of this. So one minus of one minus sine of two theta FP and one plus sine two theta FP are just are just two geometrical parameters, simple and they can be utilized. This is a three component. As you have seen that there has been proposal also to make it four component. You have seen it was before a three component, and then people went on, went on to make it a four component utilizing the helicity. Can we do it over here? Yes, we can also do it over here. Is that first we also measure a component which is over here as a helicity component. When we measure this helicity component over here, we find out the power which corresponds to the helix, the PC power. When we have the PC power, we also have the one corresponding to the volume power, which is independent again, because it is only the diffused component power. So the sum of these two powers is the one which has to be subtracted from the, from the total power, like before. Before we do not have the PC, we only had the PB. Here you have one more as a PC. And this is again the one which is the total polarized power, PR. Similarly as before, just use the two geometrical factor to put them into an odd and an even bounds. Simple as before, and this is quite fast to compute, nothing else. Now why this you need this tau parameter? As you have seen before, that if I have a dihedral, a dihedral corresponds to this minus 45. I just add two of them to show and as an example. This is an example to show. If my measurement is comprised of a dihedral and a and an helix, let's say, with some scaling, so that so it's just a convex sum of them. So if you see that for a dihedral, I have the the one which corresponds to the dihedral for theta fp corresponds corresponds to minus forty five, but it also corresponds to the same thing if it is a helix, but if it for a helix, I can use the tau parameter, I see that it is able to characterize it in a, as a separate parameter, which tells me that tau is 45 when I have an helix, even though my theta fp is minus 45. But for a target, 
which is over here as 45 if it is 45 then if it is then for a for a trihedral it the tau will be equal to zero so it it's it's characterizing different the characterizing differences when i have a mixture as we have seen before between a dihedral and a, a helix component both of them are characterized by the theta sp to be on the extremities as minus 45 but only using tau sp you can separate it out saying that well tau is a 45 when theta fp is minus 45 which corresponds to a dihedral and that's the the way i'm able to characterize between all these different targets this is a way to see how you can see this is an area of l band allos over tokyo this is the theta fp which corresponds to a mixture of urban area but mixed urban area and this is what we corresponds to the power image because if you want to see of the theta fp we have seen how we can do similarly if you can see this is an area which is of mumbai we see my radar set too i'm able to characterize the urban area very properly and the water body over here similarly the powers this is an area of l band uvsr los angeles area this is a heavily dense urban area we can also characterize the theta fp and the power so this tells me that i am able to utilize this non-conventional setting much simpler and faster and easier way to characterize different types of scattering mechanisms and also the power simultaneously we do not have to go either differently to a model based or to an eigenvalue eigenvector based over here so this concludes the third part and we just come to the next part which is the fourth part which is just some application i'll just show three quick applications uh, and then we'll see more of these applications in the next talk after this some agricultural applications so we are looking at all different research components uh, for agriculture for profitology estimation to crop classification biophysical parameter estimations and many many other things utilizing full and dual polarimetric circuit we look into an area which is uh, from the southern part of india the image which i showed in during uh, my first a few slides is the southern part of india this is i mentioned is the rice bowl of india you can see this area is uh, cultivated with the uh, paddy the idea is to see some parameters which can be derived from full polarimetric SAR data, which is equivalent to what has been developed earlier as a radar vegetation index. Radar vegetation index, as we will see, has its own limitations and problems. So we went on to give something which is called the generalized radar vegetation index. And we can see that utilizing this, we are able to see changes characterizing the growth of the paddy stage from uh, from the stage which is 11 in 2018 to uh, in august over here you can see that the growth of this paddy is over there red areas correspond to the growth of paddy in two different parts here and here but if we see the the rvi the radar vegetation index which is there in literature is unable to characterize over here when when then you have the already the rice grown stage Whereas utilizing the generalized radar vegetation index, we are able to characterize it over here. So you can see that it is able to discern these stages over here where utilizing the RVI is not possible. Moving ahead with the dates, of course, from August onwards to November, when you have the full crop growth and then at the end harvest over here you see that still it is unable the rvi is unable to capture the information but it is very well captured with the vegetation index over here it only the rvi only captures when it is harvested and the randomness is from the stubble of the field remains over here it is not from when the crop was there so this is a different way and way out in which we can find the parameter from full polarimetric SAR data and utilize a generalized form of the radar vegetation index. I'll just show a, a clip of a movie an animation which shows the, the stages in which the GRVI, the generalized radar vegetation index, changes with time over an area which is uh, 
from Manitoba and Canada, you can see with different crop types over here. And this clearly tells you with the, that it changes with different crop stages and different field conditions over here. A very nice way to characterize the vegetation growth. So you can also see something over here, the same thing which I have shown, shown before. You can see that this is for the rice cultivation. So image, this is the image occurred for, from radar set to full polarimetric SAR data so throughout the growth season. And this characterizes the dynamic change of this index. Uh, we have also moved on to give the parameter when we have uh, the data in the compact form. So the compact polarimetric form and the, and the index is called as the CPRPI, the compact RPI, which has been shown over certain soybean field over here. And you can also see similarly that the temporal variation, the dynamic uh, change of uh, from the different phenological stages of the crop over here. So utilizing this, we are proposing, we have also made some of kind of an analysis ready product with the PAI and biomass maps and so on, which can be then readily utilized in the, for the user. They are, can all be uh, computed, they can all be done on uh, the cloud-based platform. Moving on to the urban applications, so we can see that utilizing again full polarimetric SAR data, we can characterize uh, this urban area. The example was shown by Professor Freddy uh, before uh, the, the first the first lecture. You can see the same image over here. This is the Los Angeles area image of UAV SAR L band data, and you can see that I am able to characterize the full polarimetric SAR data with some kind of a parameter, which then is coming from the geodesic distance based information about the changes in what. Over here, there was no urban area, the urban area constructed over here. You can see changes similarly over here and here. That can be very, very well utilized for different kinds of change detection, detection analysis. You can also find out some kind of a built up character, characteristic. So you can find out the dominance in the built up. This is the area of ALOS2 in Mumbai. You can see that we can find out the built up scattering dominance. The dominancy map is over here. So that means that most of the, you can see that this is the dominant mechanism over here. And you can from here can find out a built up index, radar built up index, which has been proposed in this study, which tells you about is also characterized between zero and one. And this is an index where so at close to one is an urban area, zero is no urban area. So you can utilize this as an index and you can find out a map with some simple thresholding, some sorting and so on. You don't have to do any uh, sort of uh, advances uh, technique over here. Simple thresholding gives a wonderful result in terms of the built up mapping. But only utilizing a quantity, which is the RBUI, the radar built up index on full polarimetric survey. The last one I'm talking about is image clustering. Well, you do we do a lot of clustering methods and so on, but this is, only the cluster, clustering method from full polarimetric SAR data, utilizing only the physics of scattering mechanism, mechanism, nothing else more than that. And as you can see, I just utilize only the purity in the scattering, which I have just discussed a couple of seconds ago, the purity utilizing the geodesic distance and the alpha, which is the scattering mechanism. And I can just form a plane, as you have seen the H alpha plane. This is as, again as plane can be formed, which is kind of found out a theoretical boundary over here. I can form certain class classes or clusters depending upon my applied knowledge of scattering. And with this, I can form these eight clusters. And as you can see that I'm able to correctly cluster this image into these eight clusters. But everything over here is the information which is coming from the image and uh, the clustering is done without any a priori knowledge, only the physics of scattering mechanics. So again, I can do another way of doing it, but it is on a different plane. This is on kind of a, of a theta entropy plane. So over here, we characterize it with the scattering type information. So for full and compact, identically. So they are, but only that the space will be different. As you can see that, the space in which the entropy and the theta lie will be different for 
the full and the compact. Their ranges are the same, but because of the difference in the polarimetric information content over there for full and compact, their space, the space in which they will lie, which I mean is the feasible space. So you can see this is the unfeasible space over here, which is the shaded area. These are unfeasible area. So the unfeasible area will be different depending upon what the scattering mechanism is. And I can then simply again utilizing my knowledge of my physics based scattering knowledge, I can again cluster them broadly into these four and then divide them into much subclusters and make it a 12 clustering uh, plates, which can then be used for many different applications. This is the, the second methodology. I can go ahead and form another third one, which is segmentation based of again scattering based physics or physics of scattering is that I can utilize again the, the information which I got from theta FP and of course the power measurement and I can form a rule based. And these rules again comes from the scattering from different targets. So even bounds and odd and diffuse and helix and so on. And I can form different clusters over here, 24 in total in the finer stage. But if we want to be more, of course, then it is only four clusters we can form, but with the different powers, but the powers itself can be six in each. So this is a way in which we can be segmented and this can be just uh, the starting point of utilizing them in many different advanced uh, techniques which you use as uh, machine learning techniques which can be utilized. But what I want to emphasize over here is that this comes from directly the data. Data over here is fully polymetric SAR data. So with this, I go to some of the contributions which has been made in terms of uh, different indices which has been proposed for various different applications using full and dual polarimetric SAR data. And some of them you will see in action in the, in the next uh, talk. So if you uh, look into the SNAP, the latest version of the SNAP uh, toolbox, you will see that under this polarimetric, uh, you will have the polar vegetation indices and you will have the dual polarimetric indices, the compact and the generalized one, which I've just shown you, which has been proposed uh, from our lab. And these are, been, are very much in use for various different applications for agriculture. So you can if you also, also go into the polarimetric one, you will also see something like a polarimetric decompositions. And there are a couple of them which are standard and also are available in the latest version of ESA's Pulsar Pro software. It is also there available in the latest version of SNAP of this full polarimetric decomposition, the model free with three and four components, which I have just shown a couple of seconds ago. You can utilize them and play around with them over here. So this is for, this is for the full pole data for three and four component decomposition. This is the three component decomposition for the compact polarimetric data also. So coming to the last few slides over here is that we believe in reproducibility and replicability of research. And for that purpose, all what has been proposed, what I have shown are all available in, uh, in the GitHub toolbox. Uh, we have developed the Pulsar, Pulsar tools, uh, which are available, which is available. It's the QGIS plugin. It can be just utilized simply and you uh, can play around with them. There are also these functionalities which I have shown just now available in the SNAP. Uh, this is uh, the Pulsar tools. It is just a plugin to generate various different polarimetric descriptors. It is available on, for QGIS. Uh, moving on from here, what, where are we going ahead? We are going ahead with uh, more advanced uh, sensors coming into picture, which is uh, ALOS2, the Sentinel. Of course, one A is there. Fortunately, 1B is not working anymore, but we have the upcoming 1C, 1D. The NISAR is coming up. We have the ESA, Rose L mission, and so on. So there are many, many sensors and satellites, uh, space borne satellites, and coming up with uh, with uh, radar, with synthetic aperture radar, polarimetric, and dual polarimetric modes, which can be then used 
uh, for various different applications. We can also translate all this research and it can all be on the cloud with Amazon, Azure, Google Earth, and so on, map. Uh, the idea is that moving ahead with all this research which has been done with full and dual polarimetric, uh, the, can it also be translated, at least not, if not all of them, at least a few of them utilize for the GRD product also. Yes, we have done certain work which you can see, which has we utilize only the GRD product to, to, to find out uh, different mechanisms and to characterize uh, targets. Uh, so the idea is that we can utilize dual polarimetric uh, data in the GRD, and as I mentioned, we can have a framework and a pipeline to work with them also. Just for for your uh, uh, interest, there are free source, source of data available. Uh, you can just utilize them. Thanks to all these agencies for giving this, uh, for utilizing, and for understanding more of SAR uh, polarimetric. There are books available. These are excellent uh, books. Literatures are available, uh, which uh, are very, very useful. One who is the, want to study more about uh, polarimetric uh, SAR data analysis and the physics of scattering, they can all refer to these books. Uh, with this, I finish my uh, talk over here. And uh, uh, after this, uh, Dr. Deepakar Mandal will take up uh, the next two to analyze more of uh, polarimetric and uh, full polarimetric and dual polarimetric SAR data uh, for various different uh, applications, but it is mostly will concentrate on agriculture. So thank you very much for your patience. I know it was quite long, there's more of things to cover up, but I thank you very much uh, for being there. Uh, I'm open to questions if you have any. So. Just trying to see if I can have some questions on the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you all of. Thank you all. But if you have any questions, please feel free to drop in the chat box, or you can directly contact me through email. Uh, I'll be very happy to to answer or interact with uh, all of you. It will be my pleasure. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, if there are no more questions or if you come up with something uh, at a later stage, I will be available throughout, uh, maybe just uh, offline for a couple of minutes, but I'll be there till the end with Dr. Mandal. If anything comes up to your mind, please feel free to drop in the chat box or later at any point of time to write me an email. Yeah, so I just got a question. Is it possible to apply to the landslide uh, subject? Yes, sir. The, uh, thank you very much for the question. So the question is, it is, it is possible to apply to the landslide subject. So I, as I could understand is that you would like to apply this methodology to a landslide monitoring, if I am understanding it correctly. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Yes, it is possible. You, you can see some literature where they have analyzed full polarimetric SAR data for a landslide applications where they have tried to see them in terms of changes. Changes in terms of the scattering mechanism, either in terms of the power information or in terms of uh, the scattering mechanisms information. But uh, even if you do not want to go into that, you can simply look into some of the correlation measures from the measured uh, coherency or the covariance matrix uh, that will themselves give you some information of where there has been a landslide because there be a change in the mechanism of what was there and what was uh, bef what was there before and after. So this is where you can utilize in the terms of full polarimetric SAR image. 
But if you would like to utilize them in terms of interferometric, and then there are interferometric methods which can actually characterize the motion, of course, of the of the landslide and so on. But giving from where what I would have discussed in mostly for the full polarimetric information, this can only be attributed in terms of the changes in the scattering mechanism of the area in which the landslide has happened. And there are a couple of very, very nice uh, literature and nice work has been done and uh, in, in this aspect. Thank you very much for this question. So if there are no questions at the moment, I give it over to Dr. Mandel to start with the hands-on session. Thank you very much for your patience. I'll be returning back shortly. Thank you, Professor Vatisari. Uh, so before we start the practical session, we, I'll just show you some data sets which are now available on the repository. Just let me share my screen. Yeah, I guess now you can uh, see the uh, repository that, which is already shared with the participants. So within that, uh, you can see the practice session in that folder. Uh, so in that folder, you can see the available codes and the data sets which are utilized for this particular uh, practice session. And uh, specifically, there is an ins instruction file which includes the um, configuration and configuring different tools uh, which will be requiring for this session. So just, uh, just uh, give a brief summary of that. So in this uh, instruction file, uh, first we'll install Snap. Uh, so currently there is an available version is 9.0, uh, which is already included different uh, SAR polarimetric decomposition tools, as well as uh, different indices and different uh, data product readers like radar set to full polarimetric allows compact pole readers, as well as different dual pole SAR product readers. And there are several processing tools. And uh, this is a particularly built on Java, Java and it also supports Python files to um, cross-link different uh, processing pipelines. And parallelly, we also need uh, Anaconda installation, uh, so preferably Anaconda 3 with Python 3.6, because uh, currently Snap al allows uh, up, up to 3.6 and Python 3.7. So it's better to install uh, uh, Python 3.6 for uh, general operation in Anaconda and Snap. And the, one of the major important part of this configuration is Snap and Anaconda Python environment setting, which is already given with step-by-step -step, uh, methodology, which is very easy. Just we need to uh, provide the path uh, of Snap and configure Anaconda environment accordingly. And at the end, I provided some data download options, which is uh, uh, which can be found in the repository. And the codes are available in the repository, as well as we have created some uh, one GitHub rep repository dedicated for this school, uh, which can be accessed through this instruction file. Now coming to our slides. So the main aim of this uh, practice session is to utilize the dual pole SAR data and its processing in SNAP and Python environment. And we'll implement crop biophysical parameter estimation pipelines. And we'll try to map this biophysical parameter algorithms in SNAP. And at the final stage, we'll uh, also utilize different uh, tools to <clears throat> generate dual pole descriptors, which is already shown by Professor Vatacharya in his lectures. Uh, which can be utilized for further uh, studies. So coming to the first uh, session, uh, first part of this uh, session, 
Uh, we'll first see how we'll uh, utilize and download dual pole microwave data sets. Uh, so as you have know, the full pole representation of SAR data as a uh, Sinclair matrix S, which is having a co-pole and cross-pole components. And from that, we can uh, formulate the coherency and covariance matrix T and C. However, when we, uh, when we come to the dual pole SAR data, instead of a three cross three uh, coherency covariance matrix in full pole, in dual pole, we have a two cross two matrix in which C11, which is the first element, it is related to the uh, copole channel and the C22 is a cross pole channel component. So, and both of them are actually a real component and it represents the backscatter intensity in sigma VV and sigma VH. So this is very common practice to represent them in sigma scale, not in the gamma scale. And in the other two parameters, other the cross components that are actually complex value, which is a correlation between the VV and VH channels. So uh, for the time being, we'll mostly focus on the real component, which is the SVV and SVH components or the sigma naught components. Now, uh, as we have uh, two types of product with is a Sentinel-1, which is a SLC, which is a single loop complex product, which is the, all having all this phase as well as the amplitude information. And another product is the GRD product, ground range detected product, which is having only the amplitude information or the intensity information with that. So if we open now, we can uh, look into the data set. So for, uh, easy process i have uh, given uh, some pre-processed data uh, uh, with the repository we can open that in snap so <clears throat> let's see the data sets so in the data there is a sentinel one c2 matrix so now first i'll uh, indicate how we'll structure these data sets so as you can see there are two files for each image. So let's say this is the uh, one image, which is a subset image of a particular date, uh, uh, date of image taken over in uh, Vijayawada, India, which is in uh, eight, uh, 12th August, 2021. Uh, and these are already pre-processed with different pre-processing step, which we'll cover later in the slides. And this is particularly a snap configured file. Uh, which is in form of DIM format. So it's a, a snap BIM DIM map format. And it is also associated with another folder, which consists of all the data products, which is actually uh, C11, the, which we already shown in the presentation, uh, the four cro two cross two co covariance matrix, uh, C11, C22, and there is a C12 imaginary format and C12 real format. So this is the original image, which is stored in this folder, um, but for uh, Snap uses directly this DI map files to um, open this uh, images. So you can simply drag and drop these images in Snap environment. Just drag and drop in the product explorer, and it will take some little bit of time to it. <clears throat> you can see the progress file at the bottom right corner. Now, you can see this product over there. If you expand this band for a folder, you can see there is a C11, C22, C12 real, and one is imaginary. So if you want to open this image, just double click on C11, and it will open up a pre-processed product uh, of Sentinel-1 over a particular area. So this is actually a real value. You can also check its components in the pixel info and just hover your mouse to see uh, the values. So as you can see here, the C11 uh, at the uh, pixel info location, if you change the location, it will provide you the uh, numbers with having intensity of 0.14 and other values on different places. Similarly, if you can open other images, like one to real component, it's imaginary component, and the C22. Now we can also show uh, these images 
uh, style. So you can go windows and you can see tile vertically or you can move it to windows tile evenly. Now, if we want to move it and we can check different components of each features. <clears throat> so go to navigation bar and click on this synchronization view option to make the cursor in the same position. So now let's zoom it to this center section, which is actually a river. Now you can see how the values are changing with these different locations. So let's say we are considering this uh, little island and there is a water body in black color. So you can see C11, it is 0 0.05 and C22 is 0 0.0035. So it is actually C11 is VV component and C22 is VH, which is obvious C22. That's why the C22 is low intensity than the C11. And the other two are real and imaginary component of uh, that cross, cross pole channels. Now coming to the uh, images. Uh, so I already shown you the SLC product format. So if you uh, see the size of these images, these SLC products are around 4 GB, uh, whereas the DRD product, which is a ground range detected with the intensity format is very low in size, uh, but it does not have a, a imaginary component or the phase information with it. <clears throat> Now, how, we, how you want to download this? Uh, so there are uh, there are two options to download the Sentinel-1 images. One option is Alaska SAR facility website from where you can download with different region and you can provide a specific date range to download these images at a particular uh, time frame. Another com option is download these images using the Sentinel of Sci Hub Copernicus platform, where again you have to provide a region of interest and you can select different satellite platform like Sentinel 1A, 1B, and its polarization channels and product type like SLC or GRD, etc. So, uh, in both cases, you need to have a free open access uh, account with this two platform. And from that, you can download these Im images over any area in any area of your interest. Now coming to a short description of a Sentinel-1 data types, so, uh, and its format. So in Sentinel-1 acquires data in top star format. So in each image considers three subswath. So you can see here IW1, IW2, and IW3. These are three subswath, and for each subswath, there are nine bursts. So that you can see there are one up to nine bursts for each subswath, uh, and for within these two bursts, you can see there are um, black lines. So we need to remove these noises from the images. So we have to apply particular processing step uh, in the pre-processing window. Now, uh, how it acquires, when it acquires the data, we call it slice one and slice two in descending mode. Uh, so based on your region, you have to select particular which uh, subswath and which burst you want to utilize. So uh, let's say for a particular image of SLC product, you can see there is a IW1, it's indicate I underscore IW1 VH and a Q channel of IW1 of VH. And there is a virtual band, it's called intensity, uh, which is actually not stored, but just a, just a virtual product to visualize the image. And there is VV and uh, another VV for Q channel. And you can see other IW2 and similar IW3 subswats available within the same band. Now, based on your area of interest, we have to particularly select which burst and which subswat you want to process. So let's say for this particular scene, uh, we need only IW1 uh, subswath, but uh, which burst you have to select. So there are uh, several bursts starting from one to nine. So you have to select uh, third, fourth, fifth, and seventh. That's all. Now, if we uh, see the slice two in case of multi subswath operation, let's say your uh, region of interest is fall under, uh, between this IW1 and IW2. 
in that case you have to process this uh, both iw1 and iw2 subswath in the pre processing plane and this is one of the another complicated case when you have to combine two slices let's say your area of interest is uh, falling between two images acquired in a same time frame so this is two slices so you call we call it assembly of two slices so this is two three particular terms uh, commonly used in sentinel one pre processing window so this is called single subswath processing another one is multiple subswath and the third one is assembly of two slices or multiple slices now in the processing window as i said uh, smc and grd product have different uh, volume so based on your need and your uh, processing Uh, platform you have to select the grd or slc products if you don't uh, require the phase information there is no point in uh, downloading and processing the slc images but it's better to process the ground range detected product now these are the common uh, practices in the processing pipe pre processing pipelines which will follow for the grd data processing so uh, and these are very standardized uh, framework which is well established in the methodology and the literature so we start from reading the slc product or the grd product and in case of grd processing we directly apply orbit file and there is a thermal noise removal step and we have to also apply a border removal then there is a step called calibration which converts the digital number to a usable uh, backscatter intensity uh, format and as uh, then we have to apply speckle filtering which is already covered by professor freddy in his lecture uh, of to select different gaussian filter or other filtering approaches and then we have to apply the range doppler terrain correction which is similar to uh, dm correction and then finally uh, snap allows us to export this images in form of dim extension which i already showed in the previous slides but in case of uh, sl single loop data product processing the processing pipeline is little bit different because uh, we have to split the uh, top sir mode and then we have to apply a orbit file and this is one of the important step like s1 uh, tops d burst which is important to merge this two burst into a single image file so each burst is actually one slc product then we have to subset the product based on your requirement and the multi looking and polarimetric matrix generation step these are very common step we use for polarimetric analysis in snap and specifically for uh, filtering uh, there are several option available in snap but for polarimetric analysis we have to apply a polarimetric speckle filter because the general speckle filter they don't uh, consider the phase information stored in the slc product then this is step forward because the range doppler correction and terrain correction these are very common step in sar data processing and then we can export it in uh, beamed in format and as we can see the c11 is actually again i am just uh, reminding you that c11 is close similar to v sigma not vv which a backscatter intensity is vv channel whereas c22 is a vh component of it now we will see uh, the images uh, as i already showed you in the uh, snap platform how to open it and there are components of uh, this files so as you can see there are c11 which is already stored as a image file and there is a associated header file uh, similarly for c22 there is a separate images and uh, header files now these are all the steps we already showed in the presentation mode now coming to a rgb image which is one of the uh, aspect people look into different products so let's say this is all are in gray scale images which is very hard to interpret in common frame so you can also make it as a rgb image frame to analyze the targets easily so just click on the uh, image format right click on it there is a option open rgb image window in this image we can select which 
uh, bands we have to provide in red, green, and blue channels. So let's say we provide C11 in red, which is VV channel, C22 in green, and there is a ratio of C11 and by C22, which is in blue channel. And then we can just put it okay. So now you can see this is your first uh, uh, color image uh, to visualize the targets. So in this color image, you can easily identify different uh, targets like uh, river body, it's a uh, different uh, crop fields. As you can zoom into the picture, you can see different crop fields are visible very nicely in this image, as well as road network and other processes. So this is only for the visualization, but for the uh, analysis purpose, we'll utilize different aspect of uh, SNAP uh, in grayscale images. Now again, coming to this one. So as we have already the uh, basic view of Sentinel-1 images, its products, now move on to the crop biophysical parameter estimation algorithms, which is one of the important part of this session. So we'll, we can we'll, we'll utilize the same empirical model, which is called water cloud model, to estimate different biophysical parameters from Sentinel-1 products. So this is a very common and easy method for uh, vegetation modeling by a radiative transfer theory, which utilizes a single scattering radiative transfer model. Uh, so as you can see, there are crops and different radiation components, uh, like the backscatter coming from the ground. Another one is uh, the sigma crop is canopy. And there are two components, which is double bounds, like uh, 3A and 3B, which are ground canopy interaction and canopy ground interaction. And there is another component, which is ground canopy ground, which is a fourth one. So th there are this four components, there are these five uh, components, which are commonly play a role in uh, scattering from vegetation surfaces. So if we see this scattering components uh, with the S2RT model, the single scattering model, and in a simulated product, we can see the relative contribution at different incidence angle. So let's say we can consider a 30 degree incidence angle. The x-axis of the first plot is uh, sigma naught VV, whereas the second one is HH component. So horizontally transmit, horizontal receive, whereas the first one is vertical transmit and vertical receive component. And for each component, we have separated the total contribution with five component like uh, ground canopy, canopy ground and the ground canopy ground component. So as you can see the uh, yellowish line, which is the ground canopy ground component, which is very low at 30 degree incidence angle, it is almost minus 35 decibels. Whereas the canopy component and the ground component, they're quite high. They're almost around minus 16 to 17 decibels. Uh, but in case of horizontal uh, component, HH uh, wax cutter intensities, uh, this uh, components are a little bit different. At 30 degree, you can see uh, the uh, ground canopy ground component is quite high. It is almost minus 30, whereas it was minus 35 dB. And similarly, the different effects can be seen in other um, components. Now, coming to the different models. So this is one of the theoretical model which I presented just now is a S2RT radiative transfer model. So commonly used another model is semi-empirical model, which is a water cloud model proposed by Atim and Olavi in 90s, 80s. <clears throat> so in this model, the assumption is like vegetation canopy is kind of a model with a water cloud of water droplets, which are identical and uniformly distributed throughout the space. And it considers only a single scattering component. So there is no double bounds component scattering in this model. So it's, it's and it depends on different polarimetry like uh, VV and VH, it will be different for different polarization channels. So the total component is consists consist of two parts. One is vegetation, and in vegetation there is a two-way attenuation factor, which uh, related to the vegetation water content, and there is soil contribution, which is attenuated by the vegetation. So in this, uh, it is mostly affected by the moisture, soil moisture content, MV. 
and this component a b c and d these are um, model calibration factors which are required to be estimated with nonlinearly squared techniques with our measured data sets that's why we call it semi empirical model because we need a uh, ground data to calibrate this coefficient in the model. Now, when we see the sensitivity of this water cloud model, let's say uh, we will consider 8.6 gigahertz and 13 gigahertz. We can see the uh, vegetation component is uh, increasing when we have more water content and soil component, uh, the total backscatter for soil is diminishing as the vegetation water content or the vegetation parameters are increasing. So this is very common trend, but if we see compare the 8.6 gigahertz and 13 gigahertz, you can easily identify the saturation of soil moisture component, which is very early at in case of 13 gigahertz, it is uh, within one kg per meter cube vegetation water content, it saturates, whereas for uh, 8.6 gigahertz, it is almost two. So this way, the sensitivity of these two modern different frequencies are affecting the backscatter intensities at different polarization channels. Now we'll go for the uh, inversion problem. So let's say this is one of the generalized form of water cloud model, which is uh, later established with different researchers. Uh, so this total backscatter intensity is related to leaf area index, this LAI, and there is a soil moisture component MV, and we can also see there is water content W, vegetation water content in this component. Now, uh, in the forward model, we have uh, the backscatter intensities, uh, but we don't have the moisture and the vegetation properties. So the inverse problem is we have the total backscatter, we need to find the uh, soil moisture and the vegetation component. So this is a simple inversion problem, but it is not a simple inversion because this is a nonlinear function as well as we have limited number of observation because we have only two channels, VV and VH, but we have multiple unknowns like LAI from biomass as well as soil moisture. So this is an ill post problem, which is commonly solved in remote sensing using iterative optimization and lookup table search approaches. So lookup table search approach is one of the most use, uh, usable uh, search algorithm, which is commonly used in uh, different retrieval algorithms re related to vegetation as well as atmospheric sensors. So uh, how it works. So let's say we have backscatter intensity VV is uh, 0 0.0.285 and VH is 0 0.0152. And we have to estimate the soil moisture and leaf area index with the same model. So this is one of the forward model which we have uh, calibrated using the water cloud model and the ground data. So for a particular uh, uh, combination of LAI and soil moisture, we have computed or simulated the backscatter at VH and VV channels. Now. First, we will go through each row and we'll find the error function between the these rows and our given VV and VH. Uh, so we have computed an error function with the lookup table and the uh, observe, uh, given v, VV and VH polarization channels. And let's say this error for the row one is 0 0.018. Similarly, we go for the second row and find the error between this observed and the uh, lookup table uh, uh, rows. Similarly, we go through all rows and we go up to n rows and then find the minimum error. Let's say for in this uh, table, row nine is giving minimum error, which is 0 0.012. So let's say this is index row. At this error, uh, this LI is 4.58 and uh, soil moisture is 0. 4417. So this is one of the simple uh, lookup table search algorithm. So there are different opportunities to work on this inversion method. Like we can change different uh, error functions instead of simple uh, simple root square error. We can utilize different mean error or other norms. And, and we can also look through different um, minimum minimization algorithms to find out the optimum solution. 
Now, there is an issue with this lookup table approaches. Let's say if we have limited number of uh, combination of LAI and soil moisture, we can trap in this situation of first case where we have the saturation lines. So uh, if you have a given observed max scatter, you still you have a fixed range of uh, estimated LAI at two. And similarly, you can see it is arising around four. So this is the issue when we have uh, different levels of uh, parameters uh, combination. So if instead of 50 levels, if we can take 400, we can see the error function is reduced, although this is more computationally intensive. So that's why there is an issue with this lookup table approach uh, when estimate this LA and biomass products from uh, microwave data sets. So to move on these uh, processes, we can simply build a uh, uh, regression line between these observed quantities to estimate wax cutter intensities and the uh, LAI. So in literature, uh, there are several studies which uh, utilizes random forest regression, support vector ANN and linear regression, uh, which computes, which actually model between this wax cutter intensities at VH and VV and this LAI. We can build one model uh, to estimate uh, the wax cutter and there is another model which utilizes VV and VH to estimate the soil moisture. So there are two ways to estimate these properties. Now, uh, how we'll do it practically now? Let's uh, let's go through an example. So first uh, thing we have to estimate is the backscatter intensities over our uh, test sites. So let's say we have uh, different field locations, uh, which is already pro the data points are provided in this. Uh, folder, uh, there are different shape files uh, having the point locations of particular field. Uh, and uh, we overlay the point locations on our C11 and C22 images, which is VV and VH images of Sentinel-1. Then we can extract the data from the image. And uh, this is a very simple step in SNAP. Just we have to uh, load the data in SNAP port window and uh, overlay these uh, uh, shape files and then create a correlative plot. And then uh, from the correlative plot, we can save the data as a CSV file. So on, on a particular ID, let's say uh, 12 is a, one ID of one field, we have different C11 and C22 components uh, stored in that CSV file. Now we can utilize that file to uh, calibrate our water cloud model. So as we have previously shown, the water cloud model has this equation, uh, which is actually a nonlinear form and there are several coefficient. As you can see, this A, B, C, and D, these are coefficient. And from ground data, we have backscatter intensities and as well as leaf area index, soil moisture, and the biomass data for a particular field. So this is a simple curve fitting technique. And then we can estimate these parameters uh, or the coefficient A to A and B, C, D. Now going, moving ahead, uh, let's say we calibrate that model. Then we can uh, derive a, a simple regression model between the wax cutter intensities and LAI or the soil moisture. Then we can uh, have one uh, inversion model to estimate the um, LAI and biomass. <clears throat> now coming to the mapping case. So let's say you have built a support vector or a random forest model. Now we need to apply that same model for each pixel of Sentinel-1 image to estimate the leaf area index. So let's see how we'll do that. So we'll go first, we'll see through the data first. So I provided some data sets like the lookup table, which is a RICE lookup table CSV provided in the same folder. And we will utilize one image, uh, which is taken over uh, the same test site on 12th August, 2021. And one Python script, which is provided in Snappy platform. So that I'll show you now. So to run that program, we have to first open the Anaconda, uh, Anaconda command from. Uh, 
So let's see. First, then first we have to activate that uh, Anaconda Snappy environment, which I have created in the instruction file. So you have to follow the instruction file and configure the Snap and Anaconda. Now we have to activate that environment. So let's say uh, uh, activate. So we have, we have created one environment called Snappy 36. So we activate that environment. Now we have to move to the directory. So let's say we have this code, uh, one snippet code, which is called as LAI, uh, Snappy LAI mapping. We'll copy this product into the snap directory. So the snap directory is stored in another place. It's called uh, Anaconda 3 environment snappy 36 within library and there is a snappy example file we just have to paste this file over here now we have also copied the data of sentinel one pre-processed uh, c2 matrix which is stored as a beam dim file in the uh, in the data folder so in the Sentinel-1 SLC matrix, you can see C2 matrix and copy one of the image. Let's say we'll copy the 12th August 2021 uh, and associated uh, HDR files and the image files and copy them and paste them in the directory where Snappy in the test data and copy in this same directory. Now go to the command prompt and uh, move to the uh, directory where we have stored the uh, some snappy uh, snap command code. And let's say we'll copy this, we'll go to this folder first. Go to this folder, test data, examples. This we have to create LI underscore mapping. Okay, now you can see there is a two files, uh, which is one of the lookup table for rice, and another one is the snappy Python script, which is copied in this folder. Now we can move on to this folder. Now it is in that folder. Now we have to run the script with python.exe and the snappy, and the test data is stored in another directory. So simply we can run that. It may take some, some few minutes for based on your system configuration and all, all of this thing. But uh, this is one of the efficient way to generate maps in, uh, in this repository.
So when you run this code, it will generate the uh, it will in, in, take input of C11 and C22 bands from this two uh, particular date, and it generates the LI products as LI output, which can be seen in the same folder where uh, where we have stored the um, images in the uh, in the repository. So if we open that LI map, uh, it will uh, open up in a snap platform. Let's say we'll open that image here, which is already generated by the script. Simply you can drag and drop that image over here. And you can see in this LAI map output, there are two bands. One is LAI, another one is LAI flag, which is actually shows where LAI is more than some particular threshold values. So let's say we'll open that LAI product. So it is in grayscale. Now uh, one of important tasks for visualization is to change the color bar and all other things. So we can change it and change the color palette to let's say seven color. And then we can change the uh, sliders and we can move it to different range of uh, LI estimation problems like, and we can change, play around with the visualization and all this stuff. So as you can see in this case, uh, the uh, this crop plants are in the cyan color, which is LA is almost 1.17, which is are actually rice fields in that area, and can be visualized with the different images, uh, color codes. Now, uh, these are the same thing for visualization and manipulation of colors. And this at this particular stage, we are at the tailoring stage of rice with very limited growth of rice tillers. That's why we have the LI range is around one meter square per meter square. If we go for flowering and or, or other lat latter stages, LI would be more around seven to six at that range. So from that map, we can create different range of LI and biomass uh, analysis ready data products, which will give uh, output, uh, which will be an input for different uh, agronomic models used for regional studies. Let's say uh, here you can see from July up to uh, November, how the LAI over these rice fields are changing from zero to seven. Now coming towards third part of this, this session, which is dual pole descriptors. Uh, so first we'll introduce the radar vegetation index, which is already uh, provided by Professor Bhattacharya in his lecture. Uh, so this is one of the uh, dual pole descriptors we'll utilize for uh, different management of uh, act management activities and um, crop growth status determination over different areas. So this is very simple uh, derivation of uh, an index of using uh, a C2 uh, covariance matrix of SLC Sentinel-1 data product. So particularly this uh, DPRVI utilizes uh, SLC product, not the GRT product of Sentinel-1. So for SLC product, we'll start with the um, degree of polarization and there is a degree of dominance, which is shown as lambda by span. Now, if we plot these two components in a polar diagram, you can see the vegetation components which are located at the origin, uh, whereas the bare soil situations are at the right side corner, uh, which are having almost um, degree of polarization close to one and the cost component of degree of dominance close to zero. Whereas for vegetation, the uh, this cross component, cross component is almost 60 degree, which is showing more randomness and M is close to zero, which also signifies uh, more randomness coming from the vegetation surfaces. Now, if we plot these different uh, DPRVIs over canola crop, so we have seen uh, how this DPRVI is varying from uh, different dates, starting from leaf development to ripening stage, and it's varying from 0.2 to almost 0.8. Uh, 
for different fields and if we see the polar diagram where we can see how these clusters of canola field pixels varying from shifting from right side corner towards the origin so the right side corner shows the bare soil situation whereas uh, when the crop matures or at the uh, fully vegetative stage it is close to the origin which shows more randomness in the uh, scattering now we can generate these images uh, using snap or we can utilize our own codes so currently in snap we have this dedicated uh, option in the uh, toolbar so as you can see here in the radar uh, so for that we need to have a pre-processed uh, C2 matrix from generated from a SLC product of Sentinel-1. Now we can process it from radar, polarimetric, radar vegetation index. In that we have dual pole radar vegetation index. Now we can put, uh, we can keep input as uh, this image, which is taken on the particular date. And there are some processing parameter which indicates the window size. So it's varying from three to, we can also increase it up to uh, maximum up to 25, but we'll uh, currently we'll put it at three. So it is a limited window size here and just run it, this product. This is very fast computation on this system uh, because the, there is very limited number of processing step involved in this indices. So now it already generated, close it, and then open this band. So you can see there is an option DPRVI image of that particular date. And you can see a, a grayscale image, and then you can change it to different colors to check the uh, different options. So you can see here, how it is changing at defined dates. So uh, it shows uh, this on a particular day. So this is this image is generated on August, which is almost tillering stage, which shows uh, these rice fields having DPRVI close to 0.2, which is a low DPRVI because there are less vegetation growth. Uh, now, if we generate a multi-temporal image out of it, so you can see here, how these things are varying over defined dates. So let's say, uh, let's for this. So this is a 12th August image uh, over the same region. Uh, and this is 17th September. As you can see how in this area, particularly in the right bank of this river, which is grown as rice, which has indicated a higher DPRVI values on 17th September. So you can see how the color is transitioning from red to green. Green indicates some more DPRVI values close to 0.6 or 0.7. So it's uh, changing uh, with the vegetative growth condition and you can generate a regional map out of this uh, DPRVI images using the matrices. Now, uh, similar to full pole decomposition, there are other full dual pole descriptors uh, which can be utilized for GRD products. So uh, instead of a single loop complex, we can also develop different uh, descriptors, uh, which can, scattering descriptors which can be generated from a uh, GRD products. So this is one of the important aspect for a Sentinel-1 data utilization uh, for crop modeling and mapping. So we, we, we proposed several descriptors, which is one of the important one is MC. It is a copole purity parameter, which is derived from the copole cross pole ratio. And there are one scattering, pseudo scattering type parameter, theta C, which is again derived from degree of polarization and the cross pole copole components from the GRD product. And there is another descriptor called pseudo scattering entropy, which is nothing but uh, pseudo entropy derived from sigma GED and VH parameters. Now uh, we can see the ranges of these two descriptors, but theta C varying from zero degree to 45 and HC varies from zero to one. Now, if we uh, plot them, 
uh, similar to a full pole parameter H and alpha, we have theta and HC theta C uh, uh, plane, where we can see the all pixels are actually following a particular line. Although there are several regions which shows low entropy and pure scattering at Z1, and there are uh, mostly the vegetative, vegetative distributed scattering are Z5 and Z4, which is high entropy and vegetation scattering component. Now, uh, the similar codes are also provided in the uh, session uh, folder <clears throat> where we can utilize the C2 matrix or you can utilize a GRD product uh, to generate these descriptors, theta C and eight C parameters. So if we generate the image of our 12th August of theta C and the eight C, there are a minor difference between these two images. As you can see, uh, with theta C varying from uh, the first one is eight C, which is zero to one, which is changing with date. So it's indicate entropy is increasing when we have a, a high vegetative component, whereas the alpha, the theta parameter, which indicates the scattering, which is changing with uh, the scattering generating scattering components generated over rice fields due to the flooding and the tillering conditions. Now, uh, is there any change? It is very hard to detect changes from these two images. So the, the, here we comes with the simple change detection algorithms, which are already given in this uh, whole workshop in the initial uh, two sessions, where we have uh, shown different change detection techniques commonly used for optical images. So similar concept can be also transferred in case of HC, theta C, or this um, uh, SLC product domain of Sentinel-1. So instead of that, we have used a change vector analysis of these two date images, uh, and the dual pole descriptors are taken theta C and MC uh, or HC uh, for these two dates. And we generated the uh, polar diagram of change in amplitude and the direction. As you can see, there are two defined clusters which has been formed in this region. The one region is mostly forming due to the fields. Another is less change due to other vegetations like uh, crop, other crops or the rivers. Uh, you can see here the change vector of polar plot of these two change images of HC, theta C image to the particular depths. Now we can utilize this change vector uh, components uh, for a cluster analysis where we can see different classes over this region which can be utilized uh, and further improved using different other components like backscatter sigma naught or you can also utilize the dprvi or different components generated from sentinel-1 grt products now, similarly, as for, apart from this agriculture applications, there are multiple applications available of uh, with uh, uh, other categories like ship detection algorithms, which are commonly used uh, used for uh, different surveillance purposes or Maryland Maryland traffic analysis or other portions. So in that case, uh, microwave data sets are com very commonly used for polar regions where we can utilize the backscatter intensities in particular channel. And then we can detect uh, ships or different uh, vehicles or other components from the image using different algorithms. So in that purpose, instead of optical images, microwave images are playing a big role as it is cloud free and uh, there is a less impact of clouds on these images. And there are other uh, applications in crop classification and data fusion techniques where instead of classifying only two or three crops in optical images, it is very difficult to identify multiple crops. Whereas in microwave, it is more related to dielectric and its geometric properties of the target. Hence, it can be utilized for multiple crop classification within a same season. So as you can see in this particular image, you can uh, easily identify around seven crops from the scene using 
uh, different data fusion techniques along with um, data, uh, optical and micro evidence. Similar concept can be also taken uh, from LAI and biomass mapping for forestry cases where uh, water cloud model or similarly some empirical model can be utilized to estimate canopy height and canopy biomass, which is one of the major goal of uh, NICER and upcoming uh, L-band uh, satellite systems like ALOS-4. Uh, so in that purpose, forest canopy inversion is one of the useful application of uh, machine learning and uh, utilizing machine learning algorithms and uh, microwave images in that case. And uh, there is one of the interesting study recently got attention, which is a rapid revisit microwave data sets. So with the recent constellation of satellite like ICE, and uh, that is one commercial system called Capella Space, which provides a very frequent revisit data sets. So now this, how you can utilize or analyze these products for different applications. So one of the application with urban flood, ma flood mapping, which utilize a backscatter at HH component backscatter in uh, horizontal and horizontal receipt component, which shows a uh, very nice uh, mapping of flooded area within an urban region, which is very difficult with uh, very long revisit satellite uh, microwave systems. So this is one of, of the uh, uh, recent developments which are going through with utilizing of different uh, advanced statistical and machine learning algorithms in microwave data sets. So that's all for this session. I will happy to uh, have questions and uh, some queries if you have. Uh, Okay, any question from the audience for this last part of the lesson? Thank you for the presentation. Okay, if there are, thank you, very interesting. If there are no question, I think you can contact the speakers, the professors, if you have any question, you can use, uh, you can contact them by email and you can uh, keep in contact and they will be happy to answer to your questions. So it's time to close this lesson. That is the last one of our first edition of our school, online school. I want to thank you so much uh, for this interesting lesson about polarimetric synthetic virtual radar. The organization of a four hour lesson uh, from theory to practice is not so easy, but you did it in the proper way. On behalf of our technical committee, I'd like to thank you once more for your effort in producing material and providing this lesson. So, anyway, with this lesson, the first edition of our Triple E GRSS IADF online school ends. After uh, one week of lessons involving more than 70 professors and nine different topics and lessons for theory to practice, we can conclude our first experience in organizing such a kind of event. Generally speaking, we got a good interest. We received more than 700 registrations, selecting 85 people, around 10%, to join the event in our online Zoom class. We are thinking about a new edition of this school, but we started thinking about this just some weeks ago. So I don't have so much information to share with you right now. Anyway, don't worry. Everything will be communicated to our channels that you know very well. So please stay tuned. Before closing this uh, last session, I'd like to thank once again all the speakers who helped us to have such a great event our audience for attending with the interest and participation and the World Organizing Committee for their support. I think that's all for this year. So see you around. Thank you very much, Thank you very much uh, uh, Jamin and all the organizers. It was a pleasure to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.